أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان ألا تطغوا في الميزان وأقيموا الوزن بالقسط ولا تخسروا الميزان والأرض وضعها للأنام فيها فاكهة والنخل ذات الأكمام والحب ذو العصف والريحان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان خلق الإنسان من صلصال كالفخار وخلق الجان من مارج من نار فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان رب المشرقين ورب المغربين فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان مرج البحرين يلتقيان بينهما برزخ لا يبغيان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان صدق الله العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد You know I was just telling Mufti Atif that I speak a lot and I go to a lot of different places different crowds, different type of backgrounds, things like this MashaAllah but it's never been a situation this is something new for me this situation of sitting in front of ulama you know sometimes you make mistakes and you know no one's going to catch it this is not that situation anymore <laughs> so khair inshallah if you one of the benefits of doing this is that before you you have a booklet which i spent a little bit of time translating myself from a couple different works but mostly one work called badul amali and so what i'll ask the ulama to do is as we go along make little notes where you find mistakes in the Arab or where you might find mistakes in the translation and inshallah do me a favor and show it to me afterwards <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about Aqidah mostly and how we know what we know so these are two very important principles that every Muslim needs to know in fact probably even more so in our time today so I want you to pay attention this is not going to be one of those talks where it's going to be entertaining where you have a good time you can sit back and relax and maybe get a couple laughs out of it this is one of those things where it's like being in class I know it's your time off but you're still in class right now so pay attention, take notes, if something doesn't make sense, and inshallah you can ask me afterwards or even during the class if we have time to do it. But what I want you to understand is that this is like a class. So it'll be serious in that nature. Speaking about aqidah, it has different names according to the ulama, ilm al tawheed for example, the knowledge of tawheed, which gives us an idea of the importance of tawheed and its centrality to our belief system. 
Ilmul Kalam, which is another name for it. So it speaks about the science, really the very basis of Aqeedah is Tawheed, is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And really this is fitting, because as we will talk about soon, that everything we know, it starts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It originates with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So understanding Allah's oneness, understanding Tawheed is one of the most important things that we are required to do. Sorry, just get this to start working. Okay, Bismillah. So I was, as I was saying, the Aqeedah is also known as Ilm al And so from the very beginning, we understand that our belief system, our actions, our existence, everything, it starts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and specifically the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the root from which all of deen comes from. It is what every single prophet from Adam to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they all taught Tawheed. You know, sometimes fiqh, it changes. Meaning, oftentimes fiqh changes from one messenger to another. But aqidah doesn't change. The aqaid has been the same since the very beginning, from Adam alayhi salam up until today. This is one thing constant. So once we start understanding and discussing the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then from there you will start to understand the branches that come out of it. Inshallah, we'll get to that. Like ilahiyat, the things that have to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nubuwat, the things that have to do with the messengers and anbiya, and the mughayyabat, things like the, the angels and, uh, and the akhirah, uh, eschatology, these things that we will talk about uh, briefly as well. First, speaking about ilm. The source of ilm is what? Where does ilm come from? Quran. All ilm doesn't come from Quran. What is the very root of ilm? What is the root of everything? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even from the standpoint of aqidah, the mutakallimeen and the other scholars of aqidah, they say that even ilm, the source of it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like everything else. And obviously that's obvious, but the point of mentioning it and starting our talk with it is that we understand that ilm is something that is coming to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Quran, وَقَدْ أَحَطْنَا بِمَا لَدَيْهِ خُبْرًا That our knowledge it fully comprehends, it fully encompasses whatever He had or whatever anyone has with them. That for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His ilm is thati. One thing about my PowerPoint, 10%, maybe 5% of what I say will be here. The rest of you have to listen. My PowerPoints have very little on them. It's just like something to keep your attention, but you have to listen. So if you're not paying attention and this, you expect everything here, you won't find it. So Allah, from the standpoint of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ilm for him is something thati. Meaning it's part of his essence. It's not something that can be separated out from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not that Allah didn't know something first, and then came to know of it later. That is an impossibility for him. It entails, if it was a possibility, it would entail that there was a time where Allah didn't know something. 
And of course, that is an impossibility. And then he changed afterwards, that too is an impossibility. So for Allah, ilm is something that is that it is a part of his essence, it is not separable from that, separatable from that. We as makhluq though, we are different. What I have written here, actually before I get that, I don't want to go there just yet. For us as makhluq, ilm is not dhati, it is not something that you have. Naturally, I meaning it's not something that you just have as a part of your being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He did, reminds us, Wallahu akhrajukum min butuni ummihatikum la ta'alamuna shay'a. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He brought you from your mother's womb in a state you didn't know anything. La ta'alamuna shay'a. You were completely ignorant. Wa ja'ala lakum al sam'a wal basar wal abasara wal afida. And then He made for you these ways of learning ilm. He gave you hearing, He gave you sight, He gave you an intellect. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ So that you can be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for us, ilm is something iktisabi. It is kasbi. It is something that we have to gain. It's not something that we will naturally have. And so it means we have to find out what are the sources of knowledge. Where can we get it from? And not naturally expect us to just have it. Somehow by osmosis we pick it up by the person next to us. Or the culture, just, the culture just puts it into us. But rather we need to learn where to get it from so that we can obtain it in a proper way and we can take steps towards that. These are called asbab. The ways of gaining ilm, the means of gaining ilm are called asbab. And so another difference between ilm with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that with Allah, ilm has always been there. And with human beings, ilm is something hadith. Meaning it's something that wasn't there at one point and then it came there later. We were all jahil at one point, we were ignorant of whatever fact. Then we came to know of it and we became an alim of that particular fact. Once you understand this, then the next step. The scholars say, ثُمَّ أَوَّلُ مَا يَجِبُ عَلَى الْآقِلْ الْبَالِغْ أَنْ يَعْرِثَ مَا هُوَ أَوْلَ الْمَعَارِفِ That the very first thing that is obligatory on any intelligent person who is bali, who is of age, is that they understand or that they recognize the most important thing that is, there is to recognize. So you became an intelligent human being. The very first thing that is obligatory upon you to recognize, وَأَوْلَ الْمَعَارِثِ مَعْرِفَةُ لِخَالِقِهِ is to recognize who your creator is. So you understand where you came from. So you understand your purpose. All these other things that you learn, all these other things that you can run after in this dunya, that is all secondary. That is all something that comes afterwards. But the very first thing that is obligatory on every single human being is that they understand their creator. And as we will see, it doesn't take much. If you start contemplating, if you start thinking about those things around you, about yourself, then this ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this recognition of having a creator, this comes very easily. But you have to take this first step first. Allah did not create us without a purpose. We are not animals like other animals. There's something different about us. We have this capability of understanding, we have this capability of self-reflection, of thinking. And so a concept I want to put into your mind is this sentence here, I think, therefore Allah exists. If one were to contemplate just on this sentence, and inshallah as we go through the talk you'll understand it a bit more, that the very fact, as a human being you have the capability of consciousness and of thinking and self-reflection, that itself is a proof of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you only thought on it, if you only contemplate, contemplate it on it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Quran, يَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانُ an يُتْرَكَ suda. Does man, does insan, mankind think that he will be left neglected? Was he made without a purpose? And as I said, the purpose 
is that one recognize, the very first purpose is that one recognize who his or her creator is. That you come to this realization first and then you move from that point. A person, he's swimming in the ocean or maybe he's immigrating to a country. He lands in that country. That point, you have to land in the country first. You have to come out of the water onto land first. Then from there, you can actually go and do other things that you need to do or you have your mind to do. Without ever landing in that place, you can never do what it is you, you hope to accomplish. So here, the analogy is that a person needs to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and then from there, you can move forward. So our discussion is going to be about understanding our reality through Islam. And I'll tell you, because all of you guys are a little bit older, you're not children, that you all come with baggage. We all come with baggage. Your family, your culture, your community. There's certain things that they teach you as you get older. Maybe not even teaching in the way we're teaching right now but teaching in the sense that you absorb it from them. A certain way of thinking. A certain way of obtaining knowledge. And if you're lucky, then they taught you the proper way. And if you're not, especially in this country, you've picked up different ways of doing this, which may not be correct. So before we get into the next topic, I need you to keep that in your mind. To start thinking about why is it that I think the way that I do. The stuff that I think about Am I approaching it properly? Or maybe the things that I hear from other people outside of this community, from back home if you live somewhere else, is it proper? Are they teaching me things that the basis of it, the asbab, the sabab of it, is coming from a proper place? Or is it something that's not? So I'm just putting questions in your mind right now. I'm not giving you any answers, but I want you to start questioning so that you can lay this groundwork and have a more open mind about it. Now you might think, maybe some of us are thinking, Alhamdulillah, my Iman is very strong. I don't need to think about all of these things. I don't need to ask where I get my knowledge from. And that might be true. But we all know that there are people out there, maybe our family, maybe our friends. Okay. Uh, Mufti Sa was just saying that there's a black, a black pathfinder that's blocking the entrance for the sisters. So if someone has a black path, pathfinder, inshallah, if you can go and move it and let them come in. So we all know people, or we may know people, our family, friends, other people whose iman is weak. And they come to us with all kinds of questions. So in the, although your iman might be strong and you might be set and comfortable in your deen, we also need to be prepared to tackle the problems that other people are facing. And this problem will likely just get worse rather than getting better. There was a time when our ummah, when the scholars said something, they just took it. That was the authority. There was no need to question. Sheikh so and so said it, khalas, I'm done. Then a time came where people started questioning a lot. They got influenced by different philosophies and different ideologies, different groups that were groups of bid'ah started coming. The Kharijis and the Mu'tazila and, and all these others that started to come. So then the scholars realized that it wasn't good enough, it wasn't easy enough to just say, here's the correct answer that we have from the Salaf, Salaf al-Salihin, and continue with that. But instead they realized that we now have to come up with a way of explaining to people so that they understand it properly. A way of systematizing it so that we can differentiate right from wrong more easily. And so when we, maybe a hundred years ago when we were in the Muslim lands, and everyone was Muslim and everyone accepted aqidah and deen and, and tawheed. It was easy. But the situation is different now. Now the main mode of thinking seems to be one of atheism rather than theism. One of an agnosticism rather than theism. What does agnosticism mean? I don't know how much you guys know. What does agnosticism mean? What is an agnostic? So a person, an agnostic is someone who says, I don't know. He doesn't say yes, he doesn't say no, he, he just says, I don't know. Versus an atheist who says, I don't know. No, who says, I know there isn't. So very important distinction. Oftentimes the atheist is very difficult to tackle because they've already made up their mind for whatever reason. Whereas the agnostic, the true agnostic is saying, I don't know. He's being honest about it. So that is a person that is open. He says, I don't know, teach me. 
And so we come to that person and we teach them. We give them the hidayah that we have from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my point being in all of this is we first need to understand so that we can help others to understand. So this brings me to this word epistemology. Epistemology means how you know what you know. How you know what you know. This is the means, the tools that you use to gain knowledge. The ulama have considered this one of the most basic and one of the most important things in our deen. That a person understand that you don't just take ilm from any Tom, Dick and Harry or Ahmed, Musa, whatever other Muslim generic Muhammad, Abdullah that you can think of. But rather, there's a way of going about it. This topic is more important for the ulama so that you can, and you've studied this, I'm just going to phrase it in a different way, inshallah, make it a little bit clearer. It's more important for us so that we can explain things better to people, especially those who question. But it's also important to the average person as well to understand that what we believe has a systematic way of going about it. And it's not just something haphazard. We're not just picking and throwing out facts at you. But rather there's thought and there's methodology behind it. And the same thing goes with science. Science is a, has its own epistemology. It has its own ways of coming up with knowledge. Which is going to be different than how the theists, those who believe in Allah, how they do it. And the question is going to be, are the two at odds? Or is there a way of putting the two together? so that they work. Are they inherently contradictory? Or are they one in the same system and we've misunderstood them? So inshallah we'll talk about that as well. Without epistemology, you have no systematic way of thinking. You have, you're just picking up things here and there. And our scholars weren't entirely unanimous on one epistemology. They weren't entirely unanimous on this. There are some disagreements. For, Imam, for example, Imam Ghazali rahimahullah, had his own epistemology. Imam an nasafi who we'll take it from, he had his own epistemology. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, had his own epistemology. But what we'll take today is from Allama Abu Hafs an nasafi rahimahullah, one of the great Hanafi Maturidi scholars, and how he explained it in Sharh al-Aqaid. Al-Nasafi. So in the very basic, ilm comes from three sources. Number one, if it comes from oneself, without the need for a reasoning, meaning you don't have to think about it, then it is something coming from the unimpaired senses, what we called hawas, hawas salima comes from the unimpaired senses. What that means is when you see something, when you touch something, there's no thinking involved in that. I see black, automatically it's black. I don't have to deduce that it's black. I don't have to rationalize that it's black. I see it, I know it. A person might be blind, maybe they're colorblind. Now that person's hawas isn't salim. It's not unimpaired, meaning it's impaired. So we're talking about those people whose senses are unimpaired. Number two, knowledge can come from another person. They come and tell you something you don't know, or you haven't seen with your own hawas, your own senses. That is khabr. The true narration, khabr sadiq. This is a person who comes and tells you something that is correct. And then the third one is aql. This is when you don't have one of the first two. So either you obtained it from yourself, this is hawas, either someone else came and told you, this is khabar, or the other one is that you had to deduce it, you had to infer it from something, you had to think through it. This is aql. These are the three main sources of knowledge. There are more than this. For example, Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah, he gives six or seven more, uh, in addition, uh, three or four more in addition to this. But Imam Nasafi he stuck with these three because it's enough, it's sufficient. So rather than overcomplicating it, he says for you to understand and live your life 
these three are sufficient as a means of knowledge. So before I start, Allama Abu Hafs, I think I, yeah. Allama Abu Hafs, Umar ibn Muhammad al Nasafi, Rahimahullah, he was born 461 Hijri and died 537. Al Zahid al Mujtahid, he was a master in language, hadith, fiqh, aqidah. And as I mentioned, he was a Maturidi Hanafi, which means he was a Muqallid of Imam al Maturidi and Imam Abu Hanifa. He came from a town in Turkestan called Nakhshab. Nakhshab. Nakhshab became Nasafi. His book, his Aqidah, his text of Aqidah, An Nasafiyyah, is very popular, has been studied for centuries. Multiple different commentaries have been done on it. And Alhamdulillah, it is the book that we study also in our madrasa here. So I'm sure many of the ulama are familiar with it and uh, can teach this better than I can. So if you see me say something wrong, please feel free to correct it, inshallah. You have in your text in front of you, on the first page, chapter 1, it says Islamic epistemology. Asbab al-alm. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qala ahlul haq the people of truth said, حَقَائِقُ الْأَشْيَاءِ ثَابِتَةً That the realities of objects are established. What he means by that, what he means by that is that there were some people before, some philosophers before, that said, said things don't really exist. Things don't really exist. What does that mean? It's a figment of your imagination. For all we know, we could be brains in a tube somewhere, or in a vat somewhere. You could be inside the matrix, and you don't really exist. This is all just made up, it's a dream. And so, he starts off by saying that the realities of existence is true. There's no doubt about this. And there's lengthy explanations for all of this, but Imam, the different ulama make it very simple. They say, if you ever come across a person who doesn't understand this concept, then it's very easy. Throw them into a fire. If they burn, then your problem is solved. And if they jump out right away saying it was hot, then they've understood that these things exist. I mean, it's very simple. Someone says nothing exists, and the other scholars say, go and slap him. Slap him really hard. And if he says, why did you do that? Then you say, there's your proof for existence. You now understand it very clearly. So, we don't spend too much time talking about this. It's, it's obvious. It's what we say uh, in Arabic, ma'alum bid durura. It's just obvious. وَالْعِلْمُ بِهَا مُتَحَقِّقٌ خِلَافًا لِلْسُوفِسْتَ Realities of the objects are established and the knowledge of them is verifiable in contrast to the opinion of the philosophers. وَأَسْبَابُ الْعِلْمِ لِلْخَلْقِ ثَلَاثًا And the means of knowledge are three as we discussed. الْحَوَاسِ salima, وَالْخَبْرُ الصَّادِقِ وَالْعَقْلُ The unimpaired senses, the true narrations, and the intellect. One thing before we begin that we should understand is that not all knowledge is equal. Not all knowledge is equal. There are different types of knowledge. Some knowledge is stronger than other. Some knowledge is more reliable than other, others. And so we have to get this idea in our mind. Some of the ulama may already be familiar with this. You have a hadith that is known tawaturan. You know that's on one level. And you know nothing, something else is khabar ahad, khabar wahid. You know, that's on another level. So you already have this idea. What we're going to do is put it in a more systematic way so that we understand it better. So, what we have on the slide here is kind of a, a short breakdown. I try to keep it simple of this idea of knowledge being in different ways. So in two broad categories, you have knowledge, number one, that is immediately comprehension, immediate comprehension. So immediately comprehensible. It's called ad-daruri. What this means is without thinking, 
you know it to be true right away. Even a child will know it's true. It doesn't require uh, any kind of contemplation. Within that are two categories. One is called badihi, which is a priori, a priori, which essentially means these are things that you know to be true and it doesn't need to be proved. So for example, a whole is larger than its parts. Everyone understand that? A whole is larger than its parts. Is there anyone who says that can't be true? By definition it's true, right? It doesn't need contemplation, a child will tell you this is true. A circle can't be a square. Can a circle be a square? It can't. A child can tell you that. There's no way of having a circle that can be square, or a square that becomes round. It's not possible. By definition, a square has a corner to it, and a circle doesn't. So this is something badihi. Baghdad exists, or North Korea exists. Is there anyone here who has ever been to North Korea? Is there anyone that doubts North Korea exists? You've never been there, yet you believe it. This falls under the realm of Daruri. Also, other things like, so after that, the other category will be something that is Hissi, is perceived. Again, this is Daruri. There's no questioning involved here, everyone accepts this. It's self-evident, you don't need to be conv convinced of it. Fire is hot. We've all felt fire, we know it's hot. A child will come to you and tell you fire is hot. You don't need to be convinced of it. Pain, happiness, sadness, these other emotions that we feel, we all know they exist. We've all felt them. So same concept. This is Daruri. This, the point of pointing this out is that Daruri is such knowledge that we all accept, we don't question it. Only a fool would question it. And I think it's pretty obvious, I don't have to get into the rationale for it. The second, is iktisabi. This is something that is delayed. You have to gain this. You have to think about it. So for the example is the universe and everything in it is created. This may not be obvious to somebody right away. You might have to think about it a little bit. And other knowledge is like that. split screen is okay alhamdulillah everyone following so far okay. not not too abstract so now moving ahead actually so we talked about so why don't we stop here, just look at this very quickly. So you have a frame, framework in your mind how Imam Nasafi breaks this down. He says that the three ways are the unimpaired senses, then the true narrations and the sound intellect, which we've discussed. Under the true narrations, he brings two other things, something that is called mass transmitted and something that is single transmitted. Mutawatir and Khabar Ahad, or Wahid. So he starts with the senses first. He says, فَالْحَوَاسُ خَمْسِ أَسَّمْعُ وَالْبَصْرُ وَالشَّمْ وَالْلَمْسِ وَبِكُلِّ حَاسِتٍ مِنْهَا يُوْقَفُوا عَلَى مَا وُضِعَتْ هِيَا لَهِ So the senses are five. They're hearing, seeing, smelling, taste, and touch. Each of these senses informs that for which it was appointed. Meaning, each of these does what they were appointed for. You see with your eyes. You can't see with your ears. You hear with your ears, you can't hear with your sense of touch. So what this gives us is immediate knowledge. As we mentioned earlier, this is daruri knowledge. This is immediate knowledge. There's no delay, there's no comprehension. It tells you about everything in your surroundings. And what I want you to realize is that this is something that we use every single day without question. Without it, you wouldn't be able to function. You would have to stay in bed all day long. If you turned off, you say, if you said, I don't trust my five senses, you wouldn't be able to do anything. 
You would have to just stay in bed all day long. But the very fact that you trust your five senses, it allows you to go out, it allows you to do what you do. It allows you to see things, hear things, and interact with things. So, the bottom line being, you use it every single day, you rely upon it, and you don't question it. In fact, as we mentioned earlier, that when a person is born, لا تعلمون شيء Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you didn't know anything. And the very first knowledge that you experienced was this type of knowledge. Where all of a sudden you felt cold. You saw bright light. You heard the people there talking. This is the first type of knowledge that comes. And this is the knowledge that you rely upon throughout your life. So we can't underestimate its importance. What's the limitation of the senses though? Are they completely reliable? What's the limitation? Give me a limitation of the senses. Are they ever wrong? Well, like when? Yeah, so sometimes we see things, a mirage maybe, and it turns out it's not there. Sometimes you're really tired and you start seeing double, and that's not really happening. Sometimes you thought you heard someone say something, and you say, what? And that person says, I didn't say anything. Sometimes a person feels really cold, but they have a fever. And that's why they feel really cold, when it's not cold. So we get a tremendous amount of information, reliable information, only when these senses are working properly. But at times, they can be fooled. They have their limitations. There are certain things that they can't tell you. My senses can tell me what's happening in front of me, but they can't tell me what's happening on the other side of that wall. I was told that there's a section with sisters here, but I haven't seen it. So my senses have that limitation. So eventually I get to a point where my senses can't tell me everything. In child psychology, there's a term called object permanence. Anyone know what that is? Come on, you were all children once. Exactly, exactly. So children, if it's in front of them, it exists. The second it's not in front of them, it stops existing. So if mother is in front of them, they're comfortable. If mother goes around the corner, now they're not comfortable. Because they think mother disappeared. Although she could be two feet away, now they become uncomfortable. Eventually a child gets old enough to realize, realize this concept of object permanence. That even when it's not there, it still exists. Mother didn't disappear, she's around the corner. If I want, I can go there and she'll be right there waiting for me. Unfortunately, what's happened, you know, in Islam, the Islamic epistemology teaches us that there's something, uh, there is object permanence. That even if your senses can't perceive something, it continues to exist. Whereas if a person said, I only trust what my senses can tell me, that person is like a child from the standpoint of epistemology. If I can't measure it, if I can't interact with it, if I can't see it, therefore it doesn't exist, then from the standpoint of Islamic epistemology, this is like a child. You haven't outgrown that viewpoint. But, so we now understand that there are some things that are unmeasurable. There are some things that you can't pull out a ruler and measure it. Can you give me an example? We can go outside the planet and see it. What's that? I can't hear it. Someone's intellect. That's a good... Intellect, you might be able to observe indirectly. But maybe we can say someone's consciousness. Or someone's morality. Their ability to tell right from wrong. Or even the concept of morality itself. You can't measure morality. You can't say that this is good because I've measured it to be good. You can't say this is evil because I've measured it to be evil. Here's my scale, here's my thermometer, here's my you know, machine, it'll tell me if it's good or evil, let me stick it in it. We don't have anything like this, it's not measurable. So the point I want you to, I'm trying to make in different ways to you is that the senses have their limits. And when you get to that limit, then you need to find something else. You need to move beyond it. You can't be a child anymore. So Imam Nasafi, he continues, 
He says, Wal Khabr Sadiq ala Nawain. The Khabr Sadiq, the true narration is of two types. Ahdihima al Khabr al Mutawatiru. The first one is what's called mass transmitted narration. Wahuwa al Khabr al Thabitu ala al Sinati Qawmin. It is a narration established by such people. لا يتصور توتؤهم على الكذب. It is inconceivable that they would all collude on a falsehood. So it's a narration by such people that we cannot imagine that they would all come together to tell us a lie, the same lie. وهو موجب للعلم الضروري. It brings about necessary knowledge, ضروري knowledge, meaning it's not something that is questionable. The example being that he gives كَالْعِلْمِ بِالْمُلُوكِ الْخَالِيَةِ فِي الْعَزْمِنَةِ الْمَاضِيَةِ وَالْبُلْدَانِ النَّائِيَةِ Such as the knowledge of past kings and past times and of different countries. So this is knowledge that is transmitted to us in such a way that we can't doubt its reliability. Because to doubt, doubt its reliability goes flagrantly, completely against reason and how we function every single day. Meaning it's illogical to deny it. It's like somebody who says that George Washington wasn't the first president of the United States because I wasn't there to see it. Is there anyone who doubts that George Washington was the first president of the United States? Nobody does. Is there anyone who doubts, as we mentioned earlier, that North Korea exists? No one does. How do we know about these two events? Or the one place and the other event? How do we know about it? Is it just one person who told you? Mass What's that? Mass transmission. If it was one person who came and told you that there's a country called North Korea and no one else has ever mentioned this place before, then you might think he's lying. Or maybe he made a mistake. I've heard of South Korea, maybe that's what he's talking about. But when you've heard it on the news, when you've read it in the paper, when you've seen supposed pictures of it, videos of it, you know that there's some crackpot who rules the place. At that point, you gain this daruri knowledge of it. This mass transmitted knowledge of it. When you've heard George Washington was the first president of the United States from your teacher, from multiple textbooks, from different historical sources, despite the fact that you were not there to see it, you don't doubt it. Because to doubt it is silly. It's to reject something that is known completely. So the first thing is that this knowledge is daruri. The second is that this knowledge is apparent. It doesn't need reasoning. You don't have to think it through, you don't have to calculate it. You can. You can go through the books and the texts and figure it out and, and try to come up with it yourself. Or you, normally what you do is you just say, I've heard this in so many different ways, I just believe it. Why do you believe George Washington is the first president? And I, you say, oh, I've heard about it. I say, where did you hear it? Uh, in some book. What's the name of the book? I don't remember. My teacher told me. Who, what teacher? Oh, I don't remember her name either. Who else told you? And I can't tell you exactly. Well, do you doubt it then? Since you can't tell me exactly where you got it from? You know, you don't doubt it at all. So what I'm trying to show you is that the way you function in your life, the intuitive way that you go about your life, I'm pointing it out to you. Imam Nasafi is pointing it out to you. That we do all of this stuff naturally as it is. Now he's taking that and he's making it into a systematic way that you can move forward with it. So there's two types of khabar mutawatir, of a mass transmitted narration. The first one is a large group that testifies to seeing something or hearing something. So a hundred people all came and said, we saw this. In order for it to be mass transmitted in a way that we will accept it, it needs two conditions to it. The first condition is that it's not possible all of them would come together to lie about it. A hundred people said last night we looked up in the sky and we saw a fireball. It's not possible that a, those hundred people came together, told each other, listen, we're all, all going to go to Mateen and we're going to lie about this fireball in the sky. It's just it's not logical. It's not going to happen. So when a hundred people have told me this, then I accept it. That's the first condition. Or, for example, a hundred people said, we saw water coming out of the fing between the fingers of the Prophet It's not possible 
that on multiple different occasions, many hundreds of companions saw this and narrated it. It's not possible that they all got together and said, we will lie about this one thing and tell all future generations about it. That's not possible. We accept it here in our daily life. There's no reason we should reject it there. The second condition is that the description be about something hissy, something that is sensed by the five senses. Meaning, it can't be a non hissy concept. So if everyone believed that there is a Loch Ness monster, no one has ever seen it, but they all believe it. There's a fairy tooth angel? Tooth fairy? Tooth fairy. There's a tooth fairy. She comes and takes teeth when, they, when you put them under your pillow. Or there's Santa Claus. How many millions of kids believe in Santa Claus? Yet no one's ever seen him, no one's ever met him. Just because there's a hundred people saying something, doesn't necessarily make it true. The other condition is that they saw it, or heard it, or experienced it from one of their senses. So that's the first type of mass transmitted. The second type is a large group who hears from another large group. So it's not possible that that large group that you're hearing could have gotten together on that lie, and it's not possible that the next large group that they heard from have gotten together on that lie. And this can go on for many generations, you know, one large to another large to another large, or it can be just two groups. So they tell you something that it's kamiya and it's kaifiya, it's a mountain, it's haunas, it's such that you can't really doubt it. This has three conditions. The first two are the same two as that first category. That's not possible that they all came together to conspire. And number two, that it be something hissy. The third is that the later generations describe the same quantity and quality, meaning the same characteristics as the prior generations described. Meaning they're telling you the same thing. Both of these types of mass transmission give you definite, definitive knowledge. What is called qat'i, or yaqini, jazmi, gives you definitive knowledge. Both of them do. And according to Imam Nasafi, this is badihi knowledge as well. Badihi, if you remember, a priori, a priori, something that you just know it. It's something that doesn't need to be proven, shown to you, described to you, or understood. You just know it. Everyone following? This is all going to come together. So con continuing with uh, Imam Nasifi, he writes, الثاني, The second category of Khabar uh, Sadiq, Khabar Rasul, Rasul al-Mu'ayyadi bil-Mu'ajiza, wa huwa yujibu al-ilm, ilm, ilm al-istidlali. The second is a narration of the messenger who is aided by a miracle. And it brings about deductive knowledge. The knowledge established by it resembles the knowledge established by necessity, in certainty, and in permanence. So now this refers to a messenger. A messenger who came with miracles. What are miracles? Who can define a miracle for me? What is a miracle? What's the definition of a miracle? Something supernatural or extraordinary. So, you know, a extraordinary can mean something. You have a per per person with, I don't know, what, something that happens not often, but can still happen. Supernatural, though, what do you mean by that? Right, this is what, what it means. So a miracle is something that is not explainable by physics. Physical laws don't explain it. In fact, it goes against what physics tells us it should do. This is a miracle. If something was explainable, 
It might be amazing. It might be something that very rarely happens. But you can explain it. That's not a miracle. This is the fallacy that some people fall into. Some people, they say, they try to explain every single miracle scientifically. When Musa parted the seas, alayhi salam, oh, at the time the weather conditions were such that the wind was blowing this way and that way and it was a low tide and, and this happened and so it parted and he was able to pass. That's not a miracle anymore. You just explained it. It didn't need Musa, anyone could have been standing there. And the same thing would have happened. So a miracle by definition is something that is not explainable by our normal physics. And once it's explainable, it's no longer a miracle anymore. Person landing on the moon, that is an amazing thing. Has happened very few times. It is extraordinary. But it's not a miracle. We know exactly how it happened. And we can do it again if we wanted to. So here, we have a messenger who is performing miracles. He is telling us something. This knowledge is also daruri, is is known by necessity. There's certainty in it. There's no doubt in it, as Imam Nasafi is telling us. This is because, actually, before we talk about that, let's finish off this whole miracle idea. In fact, I think that's the next slide. Normalcy. Allah is the originator of normalcy. He's the creator of normalcy. What normalcy means is what Brother Amir had just explained, that it's something that goes along the laws of physics. It's along the lines of science. This happens, and we know why it happens, or at least we can explain why, or we think we can explain why it happens. So first thing, we all agree, agree that Allah is the creator of normalcy. He's the creator, creator of physics. So think of normalcy as the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what He normally does. When you jump, you come down. You throw a rock out the window, it'll fall to the ground. This is what you expect to happen, you can explain it however you explain it, but this is normal. If normalcy is negated, then only Allah could have done it. So the one who set in the rules of physics, the one who, can, who has set his sunnah, if something goes against it, something that we cannot explain, the only one who's capable of doing that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence, the person who does miracles, that miracle is being given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if a miracle occurs for some claimant to prophethood, then we know that his claim to prophethood is truthful. Because the only way that could have occurred is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused it to occur. If Allah did not want that to occur, it would not have occurred. So the logical proof for or what Imam Nasafi is alluding to when he talks about a messenger who is aided by a miracle is that here's a person who's coming and saying, I am a messenger to you from Allah. And Allah gives him a miracle as a way of saying, yes, this guy is from me. The example of this is like someone who, you know, you're sitting in, a, in the court of the king, for example. And everyone's sitting there in front of the king, his viziers and, and whoever else is normally there. And a person walks in from the entrance, the king is on his throne. A person walks in and he says, I have an important announcement from the king. I have an important announcement from the king. He asked me to walk in here and tell all of you guys this. And the king's told me to tell you, oh people, that whoever obeys what I am about to tell you, he will be rewarded for it. And whoever disobeys, he will be punished. To prove that my message is true, when I say this to you, the king is going to stand up, he's going to sit down. He's going to stand up, and he's going to sit down. Three times. So he tells him the message. What does everybody do after that? They look at the king. And the king stands up, and he sits down, and he stands up, and he sits down, and he does it three times. So although the king has not said a word, he's proven the truthfulness of that person. So the messengers are no different. The messengers come, and they give, deliver a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has decided that He is not going to reveal his, Himself to all of us. Instead, He wants Iman and Ghayb from us. So instead, what He does is He says the messenger, the messenger has a message, and He performs this miracle as a way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, 
this is my stamp of approval. This guy is really from me. He's really de delivering my message. So what Imam Nasafi is telling us is that hearing it directly from a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the same in terms of reliability as a mass transmitted narration. Of course, we know that a transmission that is a single transmission came through one, it might be mistaken. Let me take a step back again. If you were sitting in front of this messenger and he said something, this is from Allah, would you doubt it? Based upon what Imam Nasafi has just told us and the example of the king and all that, would you doubt it? You wouldn't. You say this person has been proven to be a messenger of Allah, Allah has put his stamp on him. I'm hearing the words right from his mouth. I have to obey this. There's no doubt in that. Now, what if that same message came to you through a chain of 40 different individuals? One person told another person, told another person, who told another person, and eventually came to you. Do you have reason to doubt it? Or let's say this, is there now a reason to doubt it that didn't exist before? Why? Well, it's different than that. It's definitely different. But why is there a small doubt now than there, that there wasn't before? You don't see the king. You don't see the king. Meaning you didn't see the miracle. In the example of the prophet. Okay. Come on, ulama. This is for you, students. What's the difference between a hadith that is tawatur and a hadith that is... Wahid or Ahad. Are you saying, I don't think that, I don't understand the distinction. You're saying through 40 people or from 40 different people? Through. 40 steps. Right. So the first situation is. Even, even if it was just, even if it were just one step, it's different. Right. Exactly, it is. So it's exponentially different by 40 different right. steps. You guys following? You sure? You know this. Because the reliability of the people is not the reliability of the prophet. Exactly. Right, everyone get that? What comes from the mouth of the Prophet or any prophet for that matter, is completely reliable, there's no doubt in it. The doubt only exists because other people have gotten involved now. So if you were to hear something from the Prophet the Prophet gave you a direct command, do this. You can't say, oh, you know, it's, it's mandub, it's mubah and walk away. The command is there before you. But the situation is different. When it comes through a, a chain, then now it's no longer solid as it was in that first situation. So what Imam Nasafi is saying is that when a messenger tells you something, one who is aided by a miracle, there's no doubt about his being a messenger, then that knowledge is like mass transmitted knowledge, <laughs> meaning it is as, it is like you sitting there before the Prophet is no different than mass transmitted hadith. The two are the same. You accept the mass transmission, if you're sitting there before the Prophet ﷺ, it will be the exact same thing. They're, both are yaqini, both are things that you're going to accept without any distinction. Let me give you one other, other example. How many of you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, how, who, who actually doubts that their mother is their mother? No one does. Were you there to witness it? You were there, but you can't be witness to it. Where there's so many people in the room that mass transmitted that this is your mother and I was there to witness it? No. At the most, maybe two or three people. But yet you all believe that this is your mother. No one grows up thinking that this is someone else who stole me at birth or that they might have mixed me up, or whatever the case might be. So taking khabar from someone else, taking information from someone else is really no different. Now a smart aleck might say, well, I can prove that it's my mother. How would he prove it? A DNA test. Would he be the one performing the DNA test? Would he be the one who knows exactly how a DNA test works, meaning the, not the concept, 
but the actual practical <laughs> implication of putting it down when you take a cell, put it here, you do this, you do all of that. I'm there doing it every step of the way. Will he be doing that? No. At the end of the day, he'll get a piece of paper that says, yes, this is your mother. And he accepts that piece of paper as a form of khabar as well. So the point I'm making repeatedly is that however you look at it, these are things that you use every single day intuitively in your life without questioning. We accept khabar to be fact in our everyday life. All right, let's keep moving. I don't want to fall too far behind here. So now the third one. وَأَمَّا الْأَقْلُ فَهُوَ سَبَبٌ لِلْعِلْمِ أَيْضًا وَمَا ثَبَتَ مِنْهُ بِالْبَدِيهَةِ فَهُوَ الدَّرُورِيُّ As for the intellect, it is also a cause of knowledge. Whatever is established from it by immediate perception, فَهُوَ ضَرُورِيُّ It is necessary. كَالْعِلْمِ بِأَنَّ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَعْظَمُ مِنْ جُزْئِهِ Such as the knowledge that the whole of a thing is greater than a part of it, which we talked about. وَمَا ثَبَتَ بِالْإِسْتِدْلَالِ فَهُوَ اِكْتِسَابِ Whatever is established by deduction, is acquired. So now Imam Nasafi, he moves on to the third aspect of intellect. Imam, uh, there's a book on Aqeedah called Talqis al-Adillah. And I wanted to quote something from him. He says, the only path to the recognition of Allah are intellectual proofs. But because there is no method of directly observing Allah in this dunya. Nor does it make sense to leave us waiting for wahi, as that entails neglecting us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Does man think that he will not be, or that he will be left neglected? So the only way to recognize our Creator are intellectual proofs. Surely Imam Abu Hanifa relied on intellectual proofs for this recognition. Just as Muhammad ibn Sama'a narrated from Imam Abu Yusuf, from Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, there is no excuse for anyone from creation to be ignorant of his Creator's recognition after having seen the creation of the heavens, the earth, oneself, and all of his Lord's creation. So what reasoning allows us to do, it allows us to rationalize, to determine things that we can't see immediately before us. In Talqis al he's saying that Allah is not something that you can perceive immediately before you. And Allah is not such, or He's not such that He would leave you waiting for wahi, to, for His recognition. And so He gave you this intellect instead. He gave you this intellect so that you can use it the same way that you use other things already, to understand and recognize him, to recognize him. It takes, off, it takes over where the senses leave off. My mother is around the corner, I no longer see her, but my intellect tells me that she's still there. You believe every single individual has a head. Every single human being has a head, you believe that. Yet you haven't seen every single human being. They estimate about 100 billion people that have lived so far. Could you imagine even one of them walking around who didn't have a head? But you haven't seen all of them. But you do. Your intellect is telling you this. It's giving you information that as Imam Nasafi is saying is badihi. It's obvious. You're not going to doubt it. You can reason, rationalize certain things as Imam Nasafi said that the object is larger than its parts. Or as we say, where there's smoke, there's fire. That there's certain inductive, certain ra rational inferences that you can make that are completely acceptable. What are the limitations to it though? What's the limitation to intellect? I, don't know, I feel like the students, their, their brain is already fried or... It can't tell you that? It won't be able to figure out how to worship Allah. To worship Allah. Okay, I missed that. Right, correct. But that's getting ahead. 
Meaning, <laughs> what I'm asking you is, what is your intellect? So what can it not tell you? Where, where will you? Not an example, but what is the actual limitation of it? Because things that you don't know? Can you rationalize things that you don't know? Can you come up with things that you don't know? What about like when, when you will die? So certain things are unknown to you that you can't, it kind of goes along with what he's saying that you can't really get to. What if you're just not that smart? Do we all have the same le level of intellect in this room? No. No, we don't. Some people, mashallah, are more gifted than others. So the intellect has a limitation in that you can't always be sure that your intellect is capable of reaching certain things. And it, And that too. So like if you're trying to give, someone will ask you, is, are they guilty? But I don't have enough information. Right, so you're lacking, you're lacking the input to make the decision. You saw everything. You say, I still don't know. I don't know what happened. You know, I'm missing pieces. But right. I thought, they'll ask you, did you see it all? You heard everything? Yeah, everything that I heard, I heard. Everything that I saw, I saw. But there was probably something I missed. Right, so it's still not enough. You're missing something. So the point again being that intellect has this weaknesses to it. That you're not as smart as you may think you are, and you may be missing something. Your intellect may not be proper. Some people's thinking is off. We meet those people every now and then. Their thinking is just off. And there's no other explanation to it than that. It's not mustaqim, is the, how this, the word that the scholars use for it. So, let me just summarize this before we move on to the next section. That our most important purpose is to recognize our Creator. The senses can prompt us in that direction. And they prompt us by allowing us to see things, by allowing us to hear things. The intellect provides us proofs. The khabar gives us wahi, or gives us information. Wahi is a type of information. So the senses prompt us. We see the heavens, we see, we see the earth, we see ourselves. The intellect gives us fur further proof to work with what we've seen. And as we read here, for most, this is sufficient to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is sufficient. And for those, sometimes, oftentimes, we need an indication. We need someone to come and tell us this is what it is, to put it all together. This is khabar. This is someone coming and telling us clearly that this is what it is. This is wahi. So a person can look at the entire world, use their intellect and come to the recognition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. But every now and then, some of us, they need a messenger to come and say, Allah exists. And this is why. Let's say maybe most of us nowadays, we need this. Our aql fails for it. So Imam Abu Hanifa, he said, that had Allah not sent a messenger, it would have been wajib upon creation to recognize him solely through their intellect. Now truthfully, not everyone agreed with Imam Abu Hanifa on this. But the point he makes is a strong point. That had a messenger not been sent, it would have been wajib upon creation to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala solely based upon the other gifts that he has given them. So after you understand all this, then now we use khabar, we use wahi to learn about things that we can't, our intellect fails to give us. And that is knowledge of fiqh, knowledge of sharia, knowledge of other things that we cannot come up on our own. We know that Allah exists, but how do we worship Him? That we don't know. We know that we have a Creator who is all-powerful, who has done everything we hear. We are here because of Him. He deserves to be worshipped. All of that we can do based upon our intellect. But how do I do that worship? That I need his, Him to tell me. That's where khabar comes into play. So as a point of history, there was a time, and I'm speaking about Western history, that the church had the power. It had the say. And so they pretty much dictated that this is reality. And so during that time, the thought of, to give an example of astronomy, there was what's called Ptolemic astronomy. 
which places the earth at the center of the entire universe. Everything rotates around the earth. The church accepted that for a long time. In fact, that thought came about 100 years after uh, AD. And so the church accepted that, and that's what they taught everybody. And then later on, other scientists like Galileo, Copernicus, they came and they kind of changed the model and said that the sun is at the center of the universe. So what the church did is that it overstepped its boundaries and said, no, you're wrong. Your science, we're throwing it out. It has no purpose. It's wrong in what it's saying. It threw it out. And eventually that information kept building from their side, meaning from the side of the scientists. And there was a war, not physically but intellectually, that took place in Europe. The church versus, the, versus scientists. And eventually the church lost. And science won. So people's minds moved away towards science and they pigeonholed the church. Said, your, your, your job, that's for Sunday. The rest of the days we're going to go here. Because you lost. You proved to us you don't know what you're talking about. Your model, your epistemology did not have a place for this. Well, see, it even more interesting is that as time went on, what we saw in the last century is that the church's power or the power of the theists became so small that science started to overstep its boundaries. Science is another way of saying hawas. It's another way of saying empiricism is measuring things, is gaining knowledge by measuring something. It's science. And we mentioned that one of the limitations of science or empiricism, of measure, measurement, of hawas, is that you, there's certain things you can't know, like morality. You can't know right and wrong. You can't know evil and good from measuring it. So what we saw in the last century is that this thought process when it completely got rid of religion, it took over, and then they overstepped their boundaries and started dictating morality. We saw Nazi Germany. We saw World War I, World War II. Any idea how many people died in, in those two wars? Anyone want to throw out a number? No, oh, well over a hundred million. Well over a hundred million people died. And all of this is because there was no longer a morality coming from an objective source, meaning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but rather a morality that was based upon science. So Nazi Germany started with a, a sci really a scientific conclusion that there was a superior race and an inferior race. They based that completely on science. Yeah, they also use biblical stuff to support it. But their main conclusion was based on science. And afterwards, we saw where that took them. It took them into World War Wars, which completely destroyed other nations. We, alhamdulillah, being in the United States, we don't see the effect of World War II. But Europe, even now, they see, still see the effect of it. They're completely decimated. In fact, America is what it is because it was a lone power that survived World War II. So we saw, or we see, science overstepping its boundaries now, such that we are finding people who have no morality. There's no way of telling right from wrong, because they've completely gotten rid of that. So the point I want to make with this, is that this is the mistake that Christianity made. This is the mistake that Europe and the West made. Is that they lost their compass. But in Islam, we find a place for science in the category of hawas. We find a place for the intellect in the aql and we find a place for wahi in khabar. We find a complete system that incorporates everything. So where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us morality, we take it because we know we can't get it from science. Hawas is not going to tell us morality. But where the Quran doesn't speak about building an airplane, okay, we'll take that from science. We'll take it from there. And there's no contradiction, there's no clash at all. If you understand Islamic epistemology, as Imam Nasafi put it, almost a thousand years ago, if you come to it with that fr framework, then you have a proper place for everything. And you can move forward with it, without having all the conflict that we've seen. 
Let me ask you guys another question. Does Islam give absolute knowledge? Sorry, does science, let's do that one first. Does science give absolute knowledge? No, I mean, in what science says, does it give absolute knowledge? So one thing I, I, I kind of said, but I didn't point out, some knowledge is known with certainty, and some knowledge is not. So not all knowledge is equal. Some knowledge is known with certainty, there's no doubting it, and some knowledge is not known with certainty. So some knowledge is yaqini, and some knowledge is vanni. And there's different levels within dhanni. Let's talk about the different types of knowledge. You have 1 plus 1 equals 2. Is there any doubt in that? Is there even a 1% doubt that that might be wrong? Why not? Can you prove it in a way that you cannot be doubted? You all believe 1 plus 1 is 2. But now that I'm asking you to tell me why, you can't tell me? Because 2 by definition is 1 and 1. 2 by definition is 1 and 1. You know, when we had 1, we called it 1. When we had another 1, we called it 2. By definition, this is what 2 is. So it can't be wrong. It's defined that way. Does that make sense to everyone? There's certain knowledge that we have that's analytical, like mathematics, certain types of logic. There's no doubting them. 100% certain because by definition they have to be. There's no other possibility. Then there's knowledge that is synthetic. For example, all swans are white. Are all swans white? Have you seen a non-white swan? Have you seen a swan? Pretty sure there's other colors. You're pretty sure, but have you seen one? I haven't seen a white one. So here's the thing: if you saw ten white swans, no, forget it. You saw a thousand white swans. Can you then make the assumption that all swans are white? You saw a thousand people, and they all had a head. Can you make the assumption that all people have heads? So then you are making that assumption. So let's stick with the swans one. So even if you saw a thousand, even if you saw a million swans, you will make an assumption after seeing all of them and that they're all white, you will infer that swans are white. Is this, knowledge, is this statement of all swans are white on the same level as the knowledge of 1 plus 1 equals 2? There's a difference between the two, right? Because until you've seen all the swans that exist, you're making an inference, you're assuming that they're all white, based upon what you've seen. So by definition, swans are not white. But every single one you've ever seen is white, I'm telling you, in case you've never seen one. Every single one you've seen is white. The point is that they're not, these two not types of knowledge are not the same. Analytic knowledge is what we find in mathematics and we find in certain logic. Synthetic knowledge is what you find in biology, chemistry, physics. Science is based on observation and then making inferences based upon that observation. The bottom line is that the true two are not the same. Synthetic inferences, meaning science, has two types of weaknesses. The first type of weakness is a weakness of induction, and that is a weakness that I just pointed out to you. That you are in making an induction means that you're inferring something further to something you haven't seen based upon what you've seen. So that is a weakness which you understand now. The other is something called theory ladenness, fancy term. What it means is that in science, you're taught science first, and then from that you move forward. So you can't become a doctor until you learn biology. And from bio in biology, you get taught that from fifth grade. 
And so you are being trained to think a certain way, you are being put into a certain mold, and you will continue in that way. So very few times will you find a scientist who is capable of thinking outside of the theory that he's laden into. Everyone makes, understand that? One of the amazing things about Einstein was that he was one of those people who was capable of doing that. He came up with theories that were very counterintuitive at the time. He was able to think out of that box that he was placed into. And this has happened a few times throughout history. So, these are just two of the weaknesses that we can find in science. That there's a theory of, in, there's an in, issue of induction, and then there's a theory of, of ladenness. There's other things as well, but I wanted to just point out two just to keep it simple for you. So the point I'm making at the end of the day is that you have to understand that there are things that are 100% true, they're qat'i, yaqini, and then there's other things that are dhanni, they have doubt to them, whether you're in the realm of Islamic sciences or you're in the realm of physical sciences. This is all one system. What I'm trying to do is get you to think one way no matter what field you're looking at. That your underlying epistemology is the same. In that way you can think of the entire world with one mind rather than thinking one mind for this, one mind for that. So let's, just because, you know, there's a lot more to say, but I don't have the time. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. And I want to put this into practice with the concept of evolution. Everyone knows what evolution is, right? I don't have to explain that. There's two types of evolution. There's a microevolution and there's a macroevolution. Microevolution is natural selection. For anyone who studies science, this is basically the fit survive. The strong survive. So if you have a black polar bear, chances are he's not going to survive. Why not? Why is a black polar bear not going to survive? I'm trying to get these guys to think. <laughs> right? He's not camouflaged. So chances are he'll get seen, he'll get killed, and he'll die. Whereas the white one survived. So natural selection basically means that those animals that have something that benefits them, they will continue to survive. Those that don't will get killed for whatever reason and they'll, they won't survive. So they won't have children, they won't have progeny, and then they won't, uh, they, that particular trait doesn't get carried down. So microevolution, natural selection, there's no doubt about this. And nor does it go against anything we know from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either. So that's easy, that's understandable, there's no issues there. Let's talk about macroevolution, which is also called speciation. This is when one species becomes another. So a fish eventually becomes a different type of fish, which eventually becomes a different type of fish, which eventually starts walking on land, which eventually starts doing other stuff, and you know, it becomes a whole different type of animal. Here's the problem. That one, if you start looking, what I want you to do, actually, instead of getting into the whole detail, let's look at it from the way that we've approached it so far. Is microevolution, micro, is that something that we know strongly? Yes. Why? It's, uh, happening. it's happening, we see it, we've tested for it, we can prove it, it's a, it happens even today. We see that. You have that black polar bear, you go, you shoot it, you've just proven microevolution. It's not complicated, it's not counterintuitive, it's very easy. But what about macroevolution? That's, is that stronger, weaker, the same? It's weaker because it can take long periods of time for it to... Have we seen it happen? We have not. We have not witnessed it. We cannot test for it, we cannot make it happen. We have tried to make it happen. We have tried to get one species to become another. It has not worked. It has not happened. So the level here is totally different than the other level. The level here is totally different than the other level. Just from what you guys have heard so far, that using your hawas, testing for it, causing scientific experiments, we have not been able to make this happen. Can I ask a question? 
Absolutely, yeah. So are you referring to the definition that, like, for instance, a new species won't be able to procreate with its... With right, its by that definition, yes. So we see two levels of ness here. About the, the level of knowledge here is totally different. So it's not that I'm trying to dismiss evolution entirely. What I want you to do is break it down, use what you know from our Islamic sciences, use what you know from our epistemology, and apply it here. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Quran that He created Adam, is that dhanni or yaqini? It's yaqini, right? Because we were told, by, told of it from a messenger, Mu'ayyid bin Mu'ajiza, who was proven by miracles. It was in the Quran, it's been passed down to us in a way that is mass transmitted, mutawaturan. Do you have a plug? I just need This one. Just that one. Oh, yeah, right here. Perfect. Yeah, it'll reach. So it's been transmitted to us in a way that is yaqini, as we've seen Imam Nasafi explain it to us. That it falls in the realm of khabar, sadiq. It falls in the realm of dururi, badihi. And no one doubts it. Now you have someone come along and he tells you about macro evolution, about speciation. So this is now about hawas. It's about using the intellect to a certain degree as well. We know it not to be daruri, we know it not to be yaqini, because it's dhanni. It has holes to it. It has not been proven to us in the same way as Qur'an, for example. So now in your mind, you're going to say, I know something that is daruri, yaqini. I know something here that is dhanni, or I've been told something that is dhanni. Put the two together, which one are you going to take? You take the one that's yaqini. Everyone follow that? Students follow it? You're just shaking your head and do what you do in class normally? <laughs> no one has any questions about that? No one wants to challenge that? I didn't, I didn't know the... Can you, can you define those three again? Which three? So essentially I'm using them in the same meaning in different ways. So daruri yaqini, let's just call it yaqini. Yaqini meaning that there's no doubt about its, its knowledge. And then dhanni being that it's doubtful. But there's a different level of dhan. Dhan can be something that is very doubtful or it can be something that is, uh, there's little doubt in it. But still that there's doubt in it. We're breaking at uh, four? Okay. Yeah, four is so doubtful. So I can keep going. Yeah. What time do we stop? Sorry, what did you? Four o'clock is one Okay, so we'll stop before that. So I'm going to move forward with this. Now that you have that framework of understanding your reality, you're going to look at it through the realm, through the eyes or the lens of three different things, and you're going to use those three different things to weigh which one to trust over the other. Sometimes things clash. And the, the students know, the ulama know, that once in a while you will have something that comes as a, a narration, a hadith. It might be sahih, but it may only come through one chain. And it may look like it's clashing with something in Quran. And now you have to do something with that. Either you do tatbiq and you try to bring it together, you do tarjih and you take one over the other, whatever it is, you have to determine that, okay, one is coming from Qur'an, it's yaqini, one is coming from hadith and it's dhanni, and so now I'll put that together in a certain way. The same clash will happen at times, where the Qur'an and the hadith will say something, and then science and empiricism says something else. You have to make the same determination now. And in doing that, there should be no clash in your mind. There should be no problem in your mind. The issue that people have is because they don't understand the epistemology. They only have one epistemology, and that is one of hawas. That is one of empiricism. Where if I can measure it, it exists, and if I can't, it doesn't exist. And so when that's their only framework of mind, if something they come across that they cannot measure, 
then they get stuck. You ask that person, how do you know something is good? They're stuck. They'll make up something for sure, but they're just making, up, making it up because they've got no meter to test it. They have no empirical way of knowing it. So really, they're just making it up. And so we will push them on this. And you will push yourself when you come across it. So let's talk about theism, because I want to cover this topic as well. Theism is the belief of the existence of God, the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The recognition of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can come through many ways. Many ways. And this, that itself can be a talk that lasts all day. I chose four of them just to point them out. The first is through your own fitrah, a fitrah salima. If you're fortunate enough to have a fitrah that is pure, then you will naturally incline towards Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence. You don't need to be convinced of it. There are people like this, but they're rare. Then there's ilham, where in a way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He just reveals Himself to some people. Not like prophethood, nothing like that. This is even rarer. The third is divine guidance, meaning wahi, whether it comes coming through a messenger and a book, through the Prophet Sallallahu and the Quran. So this is a person who their fitrah didn't lead them there. Of course they didn't get any ilham from Allah. And so now they rely upon the messenger and the book to tell them of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, alhamdulillah, I think most of us, these first three, is sufficient. But as I mentioned before, that if not you, then others, we should also be aware of the intellectual arguments of it as well. You don't necessarily have to understand it entirely. For the students of ilm, I would say you do have to understand it, because you will be at the forefront of this. But it's good to know that they're out there, in case you come across a person who needs it. There are three arguments for the existence of Allah. In fact, there's more than three. But again, I'm just pointing out a few. One is experiential. A person has some sort of life event, and by that they're convinced of the existence of Allah. And that's real. A lot of people have this, and that is sufficient for them. Two is by design, the design argument. That you look at the heavens, you look at the earth, and you understand that there's no way things could, could have been so, as perfect as they are had it not been for a creator who made them perfect this way. Had any of the constant, const, constants of physics been off by even a little bit, we would not see it the way it is today. That is an in-depth argument, but most people, I think, intuitively understand that. And so I'm not going to get into that today either. The third is what's called the Kalam cosmological argument. This one I'm going to get into. It's called the KCA for short. You know, when an atheist comes and says, I don't believe in Allah, and they say, prove it to me, then when they have that in mind that I need proof, they have something in their mind that they're asking for. Right? Everyone follow? If you come and say, I need proof, then there's some level that would be proof to you, right? Otherwise, if there's not, then you're just wasting time, you're just lying. But if you're truly looking for proof, then there's some standard that you have in your mind that you would consider proof. For example, they might say, if I cut, somebody's arm got cut off, if you make it grow back, I will consider that to be proof. Or if you, there's a message from Allah that shows up in the sky, I will consider that to be proof. Or if Allah shows Himself in some physical way, I will consider that to be proof. Anything they say along these lines, all, what, will ha what will be in common with all of that is that they are asking for a proof that cannot be explained through physics. It cannot be physically explained. Follow? What they're essentially asking is that I will only believe if you show me something that is quote-unquote an act of God. 
something that is not explainable. Show me something that comes from nothing. Because if it comes from something and I can explain it, then that's not proof to me anymore. You follow? So what they're saying is, show me something from nothing. And so what I'm going to walk you through, a three-step process, is that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Qur'an, فَلْيَأْتُ بِحَدِيثٍ مِثْلِهِ إِنْ كَانُوا صَادِقِينَ that he's speaking to the kuffar and, and, says, and is challenging them. That brings something like the Qur'an if you're truthful. Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in. Is it that they have been created from nothing? Remember this concept of coming from nothing. Allah is asking them. That did they come from nothing? Am humul khaliqun? Or did they make themselves? Which one is it? You don't believe in Allah? So did you come from nothing? Or did you make yourself? Am خَلَقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Did they create the heavens? Did they create the earth? بَلْ لَا يُقِنُونَ But they don't have any knowledge. They don't have any yaqeen. They don't have any true belief system. So the first premise of this argument is that whatever begins to exist has a cause of existence. Pay attention. Whatever begins to exist has a cause of existence. Is there anyone that doubts this? Because we know, as I mentioned earlier, ma'alum bid darura, it's intuitive. It's just obvious. Things don't just pop into existence. Right? The White House doesn't just boom, pop and be there. Your food doesn't just pop into existence. Everything comes from, has a cause for its existence. So if you want to negate this, it's an absurdity. If you want to say, no, things do come from nothing, that's an absurdity. And the overwhelming evidence to it is our collective life experience. None of us have as ever witnessed something coming from nothing. So the first step, is acknowledging whatever begins to exist has a cause for its existence. Where am I here? The second question, second statement, is that the universe began to exist. Does anyone doubt this? Can you try to doubt it? What if someone said the universe always existed? Suppose I'm sitting here, and you walk in the room. And very loudly I say, three, two, one, zero. Alhamdulillah, I just finished counting backwards from infinity. you would say, it's impossible, right? You would say it's impossible. I said, I just finished counting backwards from infinity and I just got to zero. Anyone not understand that? Should I stop? The point is, if, if something existed for infinity, it cannot, we could not be at this point right now. You would never hit zero. Everyone follow? If your starting point was infinity, you would never get to zero. You would never get to this point right now. So if someone says that the universe existed forever, we would say that that is impossible. Because an infinite number of events could not have occurred such that we would have gotten to where we are right now. So what this means is that the universe must have had an existence. It must have had an existence. And that existence must have had a starting point. Right? Everyone follow that? The universe must have had a starting point. Had it not had a starting point, we would not have gotten to the zero point that we are at right now. 
assuming we're at the zero point, right? And if it was infinity, there would have been too many, much random chance to bring us to this point. No, we would never get here. So you're essentially saying that an infinite number of steps have taken place to, for us to get here. And that is an impossibility. It's like me saying, when you come to this event and you left your home, your tires must spin an infinite number of times before you get here. And you would say, I can't, I'll never get here. But the fact is, you got here. So therefore, an infinite past could not have existed. There must have been a starting point. We know this from the Big Bang as well. Even in scientific terms, from our current understanding, we say that there was a Big Bang, there was a start at, to the universe. We trace it all back to a certain point that we start the universe at. So even scientific, we, scientifically, we accept that currently. So, whatever begins to exist has a cause for its existence, accepted. The universe began to exist, therefore, the universe has a cause of existence. Very simple, very straightforward, no holes to the argument. Everyone understand that? This is the argument that our scholars make, rationally. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, فَاتِرُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Speaking about Himself, that He is the originator of the heavens and the earth. جَعَلَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجَ وَمِنَ الْأَنْعَامِ أَزْوَاجَ يَذْرَعُكُمْ فِيهِ لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the originator of everything. He made spouses for you. He made uh, pairs for the animals. And He expanded everything in it. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing like Him. وَهُوَ السَّمِيُ الْبَصِيرِ He is the one who is hearing. He is the one who is seeing. Does everyone understand that? Anyone see a hole in it? Everyone hear that? They said the people who don't believe would say if there's an originator, why does it have to be God? So if we understand the fact that there cannot be an infinity to the past. There has to be a beginning point. And that beginning point has to be something that doesn't have a beginning to it. Otherwise, if it has a beginning, then that would have to have an originator. And then that would have to have an originator. And then that would have to have an originator. And so you've fallen back into that, what's called an infinite regress, going back into the past infinitely. That can't happen. That is an impossibility. So when you've acknowledged that there is a beginning, then there has to be somebody who started it, who he himself is not started. I see a lot of blank faces. If the, an infinite regress going back in the past is impossible, then it all must have started with one being. And that one being is Allah. Because there was a time when nothing existed, and then things came into existence. Something had to bring it into existence. Something had to will it into existence. Something had to have the power to bring it into existence. Something had to have the knowledge to bring it into existence. And that something, someone, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Understand? Call him what you will, he calls himself Allah. Or as your question goes, if you're an atheist, you want you want to say, how do you know that's Allah? That is the definition of Allah. He is the originator, he is the all powerful, he is the one who wills, he is the one who is he is the creator. So since we're running out of time, let me just finish this by saying that I gave you the whole point of today was to very quickly give you a crash course on understanding the entire reality of our reality, obviously not everything, our reality in such a way that you can think of it into three sets. Hawas, 
which essentially will be science and empiricism. Your khabar, information that is given to you, whether it be from wahi, Islamically, or whether it be about North Korea from the news, and your intellect and the knowledge that you get from that. In a way that your entire worldview should be able to fall within those three things. And you should then, after that, be able to take things from that and compare them as to this being stronger versus this. This is more yaqini, this is more wanni. And being able to put that together in a way such that contradictions in your mind fall away. They use the same mind, the same thinking, whether you're learning in the madrasa or you're learning in the university. It's the same thing. And then from there, you take that same understanding, you move forward with it. And if you move forward in the realm of wahi and khabar and understanding, then whatever the messenger told you, you accept it. If he tells you that this is how you do your ibadah, there's no reason to doubt that. You accept it 100% and you go forward with it. If he tells you that this is what Allah expects from you, then you do it. This is halal, this is haram, you do it. And then the second thing was about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many ways to coming to the ma'rifah of Allah. Whatever way gets you there is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you or you will run into people who need that intellectual argument or at least ask for it so that you can remove whatever doubts might be there because of their epistemology not being correct. Science is their epistemology and so they trust everything from there and they doubt everything else. And so you have to frame it for them. And one of those ways is by rationally proving the existence of Allah. This is the method that the Mutakallimun mentioned. Very much simplified, but still in a way that I think is very intuitive, very understandable for the average person, such that you walk out of here not having any intellectual doubt, and then the spiritual doubt is a separate issue, which I'll leave, leave, leave the experts to deal with that. But now, since I mentioned that, we have to understand that rational proofs will enlighten your mind. It can help awaken that fitra that you have in you. But to keep that flame going, to increase that flame, then you need deen. This is what salah is for, this is what adhkar is for, this is what ihsan is for, the entire field of ihsan. This is where you seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is where you find salvation in the akhirah. So the nature of the Qur'an is to give us that guidance so that we can seek out those things. And we can continue raising our iman, continue raising our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the example is like in the Qur'an when the companions ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the different phases that the moon passes through. And, and the, the intent behind their question was really kind of like a scientific question. Like what's happening here? But rather what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers them through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that he gives them a religious ruling instead. That you will take these phases and this is what you will do with it. Not answering the scientific, but saying that your real benefit is in the spiritual aspect of it. Your real benefit is in the religious ruling that you derive from it. So the primary concern of the ummah is going to be one of a religious and a spiritual need of fulfilling that. As I mentioned earlier, that a person needs to understand from the very beginning that the very first thing that we need to recognize is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is our primary objective. There's benefit to other things, but the primary objective is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Proofs, logic, hikmah, it won't bring you contentment in the end. It'll engage the intellect, It'll kind of awaken that, but it won't bring you contentment. Because we aren't purely <coughs> rational beings. We have a psychosocial component to us. We, you know, some people, you know something is bad. You know certain foods are bad for your health, health, yet you still eat them. Someone says, don't you know this is bad for you? Yes, it's bad for me. Don't you know smoking is bad for you? Yes, it's bad for me. Why won't you stop? I don't know. I like doing it. So it's not enough logic and, and these kind of proofs aren't sufficient. They're necessary, but they're not sufficient. And that sufficiency has to come through working on your heart, working on your deen, working on your spirituality. It's like, the example I give is like love. You know, two people love one another. When you separate them, what tends to happen?
What tends to happen when you separate two people who love each other? In the beginning you miss each other, but then what happens? Hmm? That love starts to decrease. It starts to decrease. And so the object of desire becomes less. And belief is the same way. That if you separate yourself from it, if you separate yourself from things like adhkar and, and, and Qur'an and ibadah, meaning you separate yourself from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you might have a completely rational explanation for it, meaning for the existence of Allah, but that other component it starts to weaken and eventually it starts to go away. So we, we have to stop, inshallah, for, for Asr. Inshallah, we'll pick up afterwards with the rest of this text. Jazakumullah <laughs> khair. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <clears throat> while, while people are taking snacks, inshallah, if anyone has any questions, uh, we can address that, uh, at least on this part, because the next part we're going to kind of change gears a little bit. It'll be much more relaxed, meaning it won't be that kind of abstract uh, thinking involved. Uh, one thing let me clarify from before, just to put it all together in a nice package, uh, what we discussed with theism, is that what's being said here in a logical, rational way is that We'll get to that. What's being said in a rational way is that everything that we see before us had to have a beginning. So even if we think about it from a scientific perspective, from like the Big Bang perspective, essentially what you're saying is that some, you, know, you came from your parents, who came from your parents, who came from your parents, who, let's just take it from an evolutionary, biological, you know, modern science kind of perspective, Eventually all of that goes back, it goes back to the Big Bang, and then at the Big Bang, even if we take it from a scientific perspective, we have to argue that it came from something. So to hold the belief that it just popped for no good reason, out of nowhere, is an impossibility. As we mentioned in the first premise. The second premise said that to say that the universe has always existed, that too is an impossibility and irrational to say that because nothing can have always existed and come to this point. So then what you're saying is that everything has a beginning, everything has a cause, and that beginning itself cannot have a beginning. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-awwal wal-akhir, then He is the beginning in the sense that he was always there. And he will be the end in the sense that he will always be there. Ta Allah is called Wajib al Wujud because, in order to explain the rest of existence, which has to have a beginning, we need to have something that must have brought it into existence. It's Wajib for that thing to exist, it's necessary. Otherwise, we cannot explain everything else that we see. So we call that Wajib al Wujud Allah. Now, obviously, the natural question becomes, well, where did Allah come from? That's the natural question. And the Prophet ﷺ forbade us from really thinking too much about it because the intellect can't really handle it. But as a short answer to that, the infinite regress argument is the one that our scholars mention, that just by logic, there had to have been a beginning. That nothing could have come that something has to have always been there so that it creates everything else. And if we say that it had a creator, then we will fall back into that infinite regress. That's not possible. 
their force, it, there must be something that did not have a beginning to it, and it brought everything else into existence. The other way to think about that is that we see the universe is bound by time. We see that the universe is bound by time. So if I ask you what came before you, you would say my parents. If I say what came before your parents, you would say my grandparents. And if I said what came before the universe, you would say? You would say that's an illogical question. Why is that illogical? Why does that question not make any sense? What came before the universe? The ulama think, scholar, the students. Because when you say before, you're saying there's time. Time is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you say what came before time, that doesn't make any sense because before entails that there be time. If there's no time, there's no before, there's no after. So what, became, what came before the universe? That doesn't make any sense. In fact, that still kind of makes sense because we can say the universe started and then everything came afterwards. But to say what was there before the universe, meaning what came before Allah, that is a nonsense question. Because then you're saying that time applies to Allah when Allah is the creator of it. You guys follow that? So naturally if we take everything back, so a scientist or an empiricist would say everything started from the Big Bang. And then we would say, okay, for the sake of argument, if that is correct, what came before the Big Bang? What brought the Big Bang into existence? Something must have made it come in. Otherwise, it can't just come from nowhere. And they would have to say, we don't know. And we would say, Allah did it. They would naturally say, then what came before Allah? And we would say, that question doesn't make any sense. Because time does not apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who created it. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does is He brings something out of nothing. There was a time when nothing existed besides Allah. And He brought everything into existence from nothing. This is what it means to be fatir. To bring something into existence that never was there before. From nothing, absolute nothing. Nothingness. This is all logical, this is all rational. I know a lot of you guys, your mind is like exploding. That's only because you've never heard this before. As you read more about it, then inshallah it'll make sense. It won't be that, it won't be that amazing. Any questions? Monsa. So there's the pantheist philosophy of all in one and one in all. Um, what would you say about that? I mean, because that's also uh, a very powerful belief in a less powerful, in fact, to a higher level than what we believe. Um, the less powerful, there's a union of creation and creator. <clears throat> what do we say from our epistemological point of view on that? So what Mona Asim is saying is there's some people that believe that in a way everything is Allah or everything has always been there. Everything, um, kind of like a hulul concept where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists within everything or God exists within everything. And what we've done so far is we've just proven that anything that currently exists needs to have something that brought it into existence. Meaning we see everything changes, right? Everything changes with time. I was sitting here now, I'm sitting here now, but I just walked in earlier. I had a change. And so when you start applying these kind of concepts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it leads to all kinds of absurdities. That there was a time where the universe didn't exist. So now that you're saying that there was a time when Allah didn't exist in that space that the universe occupies now, so then there was a change in him. Na'udhu billah. Changes happen. Whenever a change happens, it either, include, it either causes something to become better or it causes it to become worse. Right? When you were 12 versus when you became 19, 
Hopefully you gained some ilm and you became better in that respect. You became stronger. Then you went from 19 and you went to 39. And those of us who have done that know that you became weaker. You don't have the same kind of strength, so you lost something. So anytime there is change, no matter what change occurs, there is some increase in it or there is some decrease in it. There is some, and from one perspective it has gotten better, or from another perspective it has gotten worse. We can't apply that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One, we can't apply change to Him. And number two, we can't apply, if you say that Allah is in a better state today, then you're saying, na'udhu billah, He was in a worse state yesterday. And vice versa as well. The, the problem you run into with this kind of philosophy is you, the, all the weaknesses and deficiencies that we have in creation, we now start applying it to Allah Himself, which is an impossibility for Him. It sounds really nice <laughs> from a hippie way, but it, 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 you have to leave your intellect entirely to believe it. Anyone else? So to continue with the evolution thing, or just to finish it, that what we've, when we look at the Qur'an, there are certain things that we know without a doubt. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Adam alayhi salam. We know that without a doubt. And the concept of evolution from a macro evolution perspective that we came from chimpanzees or we came, we, we came from the same line is something that is vanni for us. It's something that we have some doubt about. We don't know it for 100%, just like any other biologic science. So when we take something that we know yaqini, and we take something that we know vanni, we take the yaqini and we leave the vann. Now when it comes to plants and animals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't clearly say in the Qur'an that I created this animal in this way from the very beginning. Or that I created this plant and this plant in this way from the very beginning. So what it does, it leaves, because we don't have yaqini knowledge that these things were created the way Adam was created. And so we can't say for sure the, say, the way that we can say for Adam alayhi salam. So it leaves it open. And at that point, you can do whatever you'd like, whether you want to go to science, whether you want to determine different, because evolution is not the only theory out there. But if you want to take that argument, then you say, okay, we have this argument, it's not very strong, but this argument exists, we can maybe try to fill in this gap, but knowing that we don't have this knowledge with yaqeen. You have to be critical of what you know and what you don't know. And so what I'm doing is I'm not throwing evolution out the window. It's not entirely baseless, but you take it for what it's worth, knowing its weaknesses knowing its limits. So the limit, obviously, as I pointed out one, is that we can't apply it to human beings, because the Qur'an specifically says so. But perhaps we can apply it to bacteria. Wallahu alam. It seems uh, that it's simple to argue the, you know, we came from, like, you know, some people will say, we came from monkeys, like, because obviously, seen a, another transformation in us again through the billions of years or whatever right so um, how can um, that theory that they bring that um, it's so easy to dismiss but yet it's like taught to us in schools and everything so it comes to that that concept of theory ladenness so when your theory already presumes the non-existence of Allah then now you have to work that way right so your theory has already presumed that Allah doesn't exist. And now we will take the evidence we have before us and we will put it together in whatever way we can and that is what we will accept. So what I, what I often t say about being an empiricist is that it's very myopic. You know, if you look through a binocular, you can see what's through the binocular but you'll miss everything else around it. And so if your only way of gaining knowledge is through your hawas, then you've excluded anything that you can gain through khabar. You've excluded whatever you can gain through certain type of logical processes. And so you, you said, I will believe only what I can see through the binocular, although there might be a tiger sitting right here outside of your field of view. 
And so essentially that's what happens. When you become very myopic with your knowledge, with your epistemology, then you miss everything else. And science, people who are pure empiricists, meaning they only take what they can measure, that's what they've done. Mom walks out the room, mom no longer exists because I no longer see her. Whereas this Islamic epistemology is much broader than that. There's things in the ghaib, we cannot see it, we cannot measure it. But we know with yaqeen, through the messenger who was sent with miracles, that it exists. Because our field of knowledge is greater. They've excluded it. Anyone else? Yeah. for there not to be communication between Allah and His creation? For example, the deist idea? We say that there have been messengers that have come. and Well, two ways. One is the rational argument that... The oh yeah, sorry about that. So the, the question is about... Uh, so actually, can you say, say the question again? <laughs> I got too far in my thought. <laughs> So the question is that Islamic epistemology assumes or takes into, maybe a better way is that it takes into account that there was communication between Allah and mankind. But if someone were to take the epistemology and say that there's no such thing as communication, then what? So one thing is that, as I mentioned earlier with the rational argument, that it doesn't make sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have created us for no good purpose. Right, so with the Kalam argument, we've proven that there must be a creator. Now, if someone were to take the opinion or take the assumption that this creator is there, we've proven him, but he just created us for no good reason. Then the, then the scholars argue that this is an illogical thing for an all-powerful, all-knowledgeable, all-wise being to do, to just create something for no good reason. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, he gave us the means, meaning He gave us intellect and He gave us... And what really separates us from the other animals is His intellect. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us His intellect for a very good reason. And the foremost reason for having an intellect is the recognition of one's Creator. And so to have the intellect, but then not use it for what it's for, then it's an, a useless gift. That it separated us from the rest of the animals, but then what was, it, what was the purpose of it? The purpose is to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, one, it doesn't make any sense that Allah would create us and then not attempt to communicate with us. To tell us, logically we know He created us, logically we know He should be worshipped, but then not give us the means to know how to worship Him. Not give us the means to know how to live our life. So from one perspective, there's a logic there. Then there's a reality that we have had prophets throughout time who have come and said that we are a messenger from Allah and then perform miracles. And you know, there's one important thing that we have to realize living in this time is that there is a very conscious effort to destroy the concept of miracles. And this is by design. This isn't by accident. Miracles are the strongest proof for prophethood. If you can convince people that miracles were fake or that they're scientifically explainable, Meaning before you even look into it, the second someone says something that is not explainable, you dismiss it. Then you've cut yourself off from communication with Allah because you've cut yourself off from the prophets. So what Islamic epistemology does is it says that we know there have been anbiya that have come, they've claimed prophethood, and then they've performed miracles that we cannot explain. How do we know about these miracles? They've been told to us through mass transmission. We can't deny them. We cannot deny that the moon was split in half. The Qur'an mentions it through mass transmission. We cannot deny that water came out of the blessed fingers of the Prophet ﷺ because it was transmitted to us mass tra in, mass, in a mass way. We cannot deny as a whole that the Prophet ﷺ had done many, many miracles because we know that through mass transmission. 
we can't ignore these realities, we can't ignore these facts that have come to us. So we have a person claiming to be the Messenger of Allah, we have miracles from him that are supernatural, unexplainable, we can't just turn a blind eye to that. So we incorporate that into our epistemology, and we say that we have to accept this. Whether you like it or not, you have to accept it. And so we move forward with that. And of course, we use that same epistemology in other, like Mu'asim was asking about media. So when the news tells you something, then the same thing. You're going to say, okay, all 10, channel news, all 10 channels with their news told me the same thing tonight. Is that mass transmission? Is it? You have to see what the source is. If the source is the same person, <coughs> Donald Trump said we need a wall. So all 10 news channels said we need a wall. You're going to say, where did you get this from? And all 10 said Donald Trump. That's not mass transmission. It is, but the source is the same. So now the weakness of that source lies in the weakness of the individual. This is the same concepts our, our students, mashallah, they learn in school and this is what they're teaching in the, and what they, what they themselves will go on to teach later on. We all know this from our studies of a hadith. The thing is now using it for the rest of our life and our other things. There's no separation here between church and state. There's no need to. Yeah, so what the, what the brother is describing is, um, in fact, it's normally attributed to Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, this, this opinion, or this idea, that we, we all, in our fitrah, have this uh, understanding of a reckoning ma'rif of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that comes from alastu bi rabbikum when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked everybody, am I not your Rabb? It's just that it's there, but it's forgotten. And so in your lifetime, you can be reminded of it, it awakens that fitrah. And so in that awakening, that people have found a way back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the recognition of Allah. So again, like as I said, there's many ways to it. But nowadays we live in a realm where if you said this to the atheist, it's no more convincing than anything else. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't even say atheist anymore. There are many Muslims out there who, who need this, who need a rational explanation just because of the environment that they are growing up in. So a lot of Muslims walk around with a lot of doubt and normally when they go to college or they go to some other place where they are challenged, that's where it all falls apart. And the reference I gave is from this. Imashia. This is a question, but this is an announcement. So the question here is, uh, the worldview for Muslim falls into three categories, as we mentioned. My question is, should one of the should one give one of the three more credit or importance over the others? So what one needs to understand is the limitations between them. So we start off with our own senses. And we understand that there are certain things that our senses will tell us. As I said, we can't know what's outside of the room. In fact, as far as we know, what's outside of the room may not even exist while we're here. So we, our senses have that limitation. Now we move beyond that limitation, for example, through khabar. I've never been to North Korea, I've never sensed it, but at least I accept it because people have told me about it. And then even that has its limitations, and eventually there's certain things of the ghayb that no one can really, in this dunya now, tell me about it, nor can I sense it, and so I, fall, I, am, I am dependent upon khabar, i.e. wahi, to know about those things. 
So it's not necessarily that you one take precedence over the other, but that you understand the limitations of each one. That your senses have a limitation, your aql has a limitation. For we we could once you understand wahi, then you will say there's no limitation there. That that would trump everything else as long as what's coming through you through wahi is coming through you to you in a way that is yaqini, whether it be mass transmitted Quran or mass tra from the Quran or mass transmitted from the hadith. So it's not that you should rely on any one of them alone. It's that you should take them all and put them in their proper place and understand, uh, be critical of the knowledge that you're receiving. And then I guess this is an announcement. If uh, anyone has any questions on the sister's side, just write them down and one of the sisters will uh, collect them. Inshallah. Okay. So inshallah, let's move on to the next. If you have any questions, we can always uh, ask. So the next section, chapter 3 now, is a matan of aqidah. called Bad'ul Amali. What I was hoping to do was that once you understand your epistemology and you have a good grounding for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least rationally, then you move forward from that and you start going into what does our deen teach us? What have we learned through khabar, through wahi? And what this matan does is it writes down those things that we know in a very strong way through wahi leaving out the issues that we don't know in a strong way aqidah the word is saf, ayn, qaf, dal it has the meaning of tying a knot uqda of tying a knot and so a knot is something that once it's tied it shouldn't be untieable it should not be taken apart. You tie it, you put it around you, you tighten this knot of aqidah, and it remains there forever. Your deen is never untied, it's never taken off. No matter where you are, who you are, stage of life, situation, that aqidah stays. We were just talking about this in the, uh, I do an adult class on fiqh, that when you have a situation of darura, almost every ruling in Islam can be violated in the situation of darura, except one. You can eat haram if you haven't eaten in three days. You can drink alcohol if you haven't drank in three days. If you're going to die, you can take haram medication if it is the only medication allowable that will save your life. So if a darura is there, haram can become halal. In fact, sometimes it becomes wajib to do that. There's one exception to that rule. A person can even say a word of kufr to save their life. But there's one exception to the rule that you cannot do. What is that? Sure. You can't inside your heart take away iman. You can't do shirk. You can say a word of shirk if forced to, but the heart has to be accepting Islam. Aqidah is that thing, once it's tied, it never gets untied. No matter what. No matter the situation. It is not open to ijtihad. It is not something, it is something that we take directly from Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not something that changes either. You know, in fiqh we see that there's proofs, we look at different things, we weigh them, we do qiyas and things like this. This doesn't occur in Aqidah. In Aqidah, what the Prophet and Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have said, we're taking that and we're not going much beyond that. And the importance of it, we saw almost immediately after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, we saw that there were people who denied that they have to give zakah. They denied the fardiyah of zakat on them after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he declared war and he fought them over it. He didn't fight them over the fact that they weren't giving it. He fought them over the fact that they thought they didn't have to give it. He went to war over an aqidah point to save the ummah. 
Badu al-Amali was written by Allama Ushi. Let's see if I have his name up here. Abu Muhammad Siraj al-Din Ali ibn Uthman ibn Muhammad ibn Sulaiman ibn Taymi ibn Ushi al-Fargani al-Hanafi. He was from a town in Kyrgyzstan called Ush. And very little is known about his life. We don't know, we know he was from this town, but we don't know if he was born there. We don't know what year he was born in. We don't know how long of a life he lived. We know he died in about 575 Hijri. We don't know who his teachers were. We don't know who his students were. But many Hanafi ulama have praised him, calling him Allama, Imam, Qadi, Sheikh, Muhaqqiq. But this one particular work is what's most known about him. 30 different commentaries, at least 30 different commentaries have been written on this one work, on this one matan, including Mullah Ali Qari, Rahimullah, and most recently, Mufti Rida from South Africa. So it's a well-accepted text. I just want to put it down somewhere. So I don't really need it. So I, I translated this work over the past few months and uh, I wanted to read through it. And inshallah, every, here and there we'll comment on it. But uh, I don't, if we really wanted to get into depth with it, then there really wouldn't be any end to it. Does everyone have a book? If yeah. not, then we can put it on there. Okay, put the book on there. You sent me the PDF, right? So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim يقول العبد في بدء الأمال لتوحيد بنظم كالعالي He says the slave states in the beginning of the dictations meaning بدء الأمال is the name of the text of the work So either we say he says in the beginning of the text بدء الأمال or I translate it out in the beginning of the dictations and it's interesting that he uses this word abd. So the commentators say about it, that right from the very beginning, he admits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is our relationship. And really, only Islam is in love with this relationship of abdiyah between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that we have surrendered entirely to Him. What you want, Ya Allah, that is what we want. We have no expectations on you. This is who we are. You tell us. Whereas you see in other religions, normally the approach is different. Our God is a God of love. So right away, the relationship is different. Is that we want this from you, this is what we expect from you. Whereas from the very beginning, Allama Ushi is explaining, he's, he's just admitting his, his slavehood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The slave states in the beginning of the dictations, so he may clarify Tawheed through a poem resembling pearls. This concept of Tawheed, you know, like it's one of those things that you can spend weeks and weeks talking about. And uh, I, I thought I'd, I'd mention it, but you know, now with the time being how it is, we don't really have too much time to get into it. But let me just mention about the concept of Tawheed, that it is something that one has to have in their heart, completely accepted. And the true Iman, it exists within the heart itself. So if a person has Iman in their heart and they didn't have the opportunity to express it to anyone, I believed in Allah, 
but I never came across anyone such that I could say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah or even La ilaha illallah then we have the possibility of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepting this person's iman and sending that person to Jannah over it. So the true iman according to our scholars it lies within the heart. A person is required to say it if the opportunity arrives, arri arrives. and then of course the actions should be based upon it as well. It says, إله الخلق مولانا قديم قديم وموسوف بأوصاف الكمال The God of all creation, our master, is pre-eternal. Qadim. Qadim is something that it has always existed. And by always existed, I mean to say without time. Pre-eternal, when you say the word eternal by itself, it implies that there was time involved. Pre-eternal means without any time applying to it. And as I mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one who created time. To apply time to him is not a possibility, it's an impossibility. So Allah is Qadim. وَمَوْسُوفٌ بِأَوْصَافِ الْكَمَالِ And he is characterized with the attributes of perfection. And that too, as I mentioned earlier, is that Allah has been perfect, is perfect, will always be perfect. So the one to whom time does not apply, there is no change in his characteristics. It's not that with time he becomes more perfect or less. He is perfect, he remains that way. He is the ever living, the director of each affair. He is truthful, the dispenser, the majestic. You know, we call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Khaliq, the creator. And you know, I know, the, I know this to students and the ulama already know this, but as a point of reminding us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always been the creator, even before creation. A person creates a car, and afterwards he's known as the creator of that car, he's the one who made the car. Before that, we don't call him the maker of the car. We don't call someone a father before he has his child. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is khaliq, even before makhluk came into existence. For the same reason as I mentioned, that if he were to become a khaliq later, it would imply a change in his nature. And change implies time. And that is an impossibility. Allah is living. So, in this, Allah is living because only something that is living, someone that is living, could give life to something else. He is the director in that everything happens because He has directed it to happen. He is the truth, the dispenser, and the majestic. And these are all characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Actually, before I say that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Wallahu khalaqakum. وَمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah says that I created you and everything that you do. I created you and everything that you do. So the belief of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that Allah has created your actions. Nothing that you do, not from your breathing, not from your raising a finger, is a creation of your own, but rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who brings it into existence, as He brings everything else into existence. Rather what happens as the next line says, مُرِيدُ الْخَيْرِ وَالشَّرِّ الْقَبِيحِ وَلَكِنْ لَيْسَ يَرْضَ بِالْمُحَالِ He wills the good and the exceedingly bad. وَالشَّرِّ الْقَبِيحِ is to do ta'kid of sharh, of sharh, that is something really bad, except he is not pleased with the wrong. So whatever happens, good or bad, actually let me take a step back from that and explain that as well. From the Islamic standpoint, what is good, what is bad? I know I brought this up earlier, morality. What is good, what is bad from our standpoint? How do you know something is good?
in the positive way and you have a positive feeling for that. So once you feel bad, like you're doing something wrong, you also get that kind of feeling also that I shouldn't do this. That's how you know. Is that always true? And sometimes as a country, we bomb other countries and we say it's good. But why would we? So many peoples are... Because those people have taken away the freedom of their own people. Or they're against our freedom. They don't like liberty. Not every person is the same person. So then you might feel bad about something and I might not feel bad about it. We're all humans. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you call, like if I'm a person from Pakistan, people tell me that you're not good. The country, the people over there, they're corrupted, everything else. Right. But not everybody's the same. Everybody has a different level. There's also good people over there. Right. Right. Same in the U.S. You find good people, you find bad people. You decide which one you want to go side with. That's how right. you know. So your point is valid to an extent. It's valid in that a person who has a proper fitrah, the Prophet told us that that is someone the fitrah will generally guide them in the proper direction. But that has a big condition on it, that condition being that you have a proper fitrah. And as we've, you know, I wasn't trying to challenge you or anything like that, I just wanted to make the point that what someone feels can oftentimes be wrong. How many dumb young people fall in love and feel it's the right thing to do, to do things that are haram, and vice versa. So our feelings are not reliable, is, is the point I want to make. And oftentimes your feelings might clash with my feelings on the same topic. So now who is right, you or me? In it, from the Islamic perspective, what is good is the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is bad is the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's very simple, very easy. From the perspective of makhluq, from the perspective of creation, if Allah has said this is good, it's good. If Allah said this is bad, this is bad. There are times when killing becomes good. And we know that from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, in warfare. There are times, most of the time, when killing is bad. To take a life without haqq, this is bad. And we know that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that. Although this is the same act. The same act of taking a life, it's one act. But yet in one situation it's good, in another situation it's bad. And that's purely, entirely, that's purely because one is obedience and one is disobedience. Any other criteria that you try to take will be subjective and will be contradictory. One person will feel one way, another person will feel another way. So from the perspective of mankind, what is good in the Islamic sense is whatever is obedience of Allah. Whatever is, what is bad is what is disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So at the end of the day, fiqh is trying to decipher what is good and what is bad. And to what degree? From the perspective of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is an invalid question. What is good for Allah to do? What is evil for Allah to do? That is an invalid question. That question is nonsense. Because the definition of good and bad is the obedience of Allah and Allah does not obey anyone, nor does He need to. What He does, He does in His own dominion as He wants to do. As students, we are all given the example that if a person goes and he destroys his car, it's his prerogative. It's not an evil thing he's done on his car. It's his prerogative. If he destroys it, that's perfectly fine. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to do anything in his creation, that's his prerogative. There is no concept of good or evil that gets applied to that. So, murid al-khayri wa sharr al-qabih, from the perspective that of humankind, what we consider good and what we consider to be bad, it can only occur because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows it to occur. So there's two concepts. There's a concept of willing something, meaning allowing it to occur, and there's a second concept of being pleased with it. Those are two different things. Oftentimes when we think about will, we think acceptance along with it. We think pl please, being pleased with it along with it. These are two different concepts. A nothing happens except that Allah wills it to happen. But Allah may or may not be pleased with what, ha what occurred. So the point he's trying to make here is that Allah wills good and He wills bad from the perspective of us, not from His perspective. It's good and bad from our perspective. From His perspective, there is no good or bad. What He does, He does, He can do. 
So from our perspective, if it's good, it's bad, either way Allah has willed that to occur. Otherwise it wouldn't occur. Except he is not pleased with wrong. He is not pleased with disobedience. The word he, he uses bil muhal. Muhal is something impossible. The scholars write that the reason he uses, uses the word muhal is that he's referring to the impossible, and the impossible is that a believer would sin. That a believer would, dis, would disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or from more of like a shara'an perspective, he's doing something that is inco incorrect. So those who understand Arabic, they may say, but bil muhal, muhal is impossible, that doesn't make sense here. The, comment, com, the ones who have written their commentaries have said that what he means here is to do something wrong or to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, a lengthy topic, but uh, maybe another time we'll get into it. Sifatullahi laysat ayna dhatin wala ghayran siwahu dhan fisali. Allah's attributes are not the essence, nor distinct or separate from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, when we speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we speak about two aspects of Him. One is the that. The that is the essence of Allah. It is, the, it is Allah Himself. And then there's the sifat of Allah, His characteristics, His attributes. And those are two different things. They're different and they're not at the same time. And this is the, this is the point He's making here. That Allah's attributes are not the essence. The sifat are, sep are separate. Because an attribute of something is always different than it. Right? Brother Sher is wearing blue today. Tomorrow he might be wearing green. But he hasn't changed. He's still Sher. He's not someone else. So the sifat of something is not the same as it's that. It's two different things. So in that way, it's, not, it, it's separate. But in another way, the sifat of Allah cannot be separated from him. Because separation implies change, and change is impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One general rule in Aqidah is that you can try to understand, you can understand what Allah is not. But you will never understand what Allah is. You can understand what Allah is not, laysa kamithilihi shay, but you cannot understand what Allah is, because He's not like anything we can imagine. Because even what you imagine is a shay, is something, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He's not like that. Nusamiya Allah shay'an laka al ashya. وَذَاتًا عَنْ جِهَاتِ السِّتِّ خَالِي Actually, I missed one, didn't I? صِفَاتُ ذَاتِ The one before it. صِفَاتُ ذَاتِ وَالْأَفْعَالِ طُرًّا قَدِيمَاتٌ مَوْسُونَاتُ الزَّوَالِ All the attributes of the essence and actions are pre-eternal without any ending. There are attributes that refer to the that of Allah and there are attributes that refer to the sifat of Allah or the actions of Allah. The attributes that refer to the that of Allah are those attributes where the opposite of it is impossible. The opposite of it is impossible. Allah is living. Can He be the opposite of it? He cannot be. Allah is powerful. Can He be the opposite of it? He cannot be. Allah is hearing. Can He be deaf, the opposite of it? He cannot be. So these are the sifat of the that. The sifat of the af'al are things like Allah is pleased. Can He be displeased? He can. Right? He can be displeased with our actions. And He is. This is the difference between those two. The point he's making is that they are pre-eternal, just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think we've made this clear already, that the attributes of Allah must be pre-eternal. Otherwise, it would mean that they came later, 
and that would imply a change to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is an impossibility. And he is without ending in the same way. One thing Mullah, Mullah, uh, Mullah Ali Qari, he says about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, understanding Allah, he says, وَالْعَجْزُ أَنْ دَرْكِ الْإِدْرَاكِ idrak." That the very understanding that one is incapable of re the realization of Allah, that is a realization in itself. Understanding that you are incapable of understanding Allah, that is an understanding in itself. And that is the understanding that we need to come to, or what uh, he's trying to, to point out here. And one of the things. So he's so the next line. نُسَمِّيَ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا كَالْأَشْيَاءِ وَذَاتًا عَنْ جِهَاتِ السِّتِّ خَالِي We call Allah a shay. We call Allah a shay, not like other things, and a that devoid of the six directions. Shay here, for when it gets used for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, normally we translate shay as being something, a thing. But shay here, when it's used for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has, comes in the meaning of mawjood, comes in the meaning of existing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He exists. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, in Quran, He says, قُلْ, قُلْ أَيُّ شَيْءٍ أَكْبَرُ أَكْبَرُ الشَّهَادَةً قُلِ اللَّهِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the ayah, He's referring to Himself as a shay. And so, Allama Ushi is saying that we call Allah a shay, one, because He called Himself that. But the meaning that we use, he's not like the shay of other things. He's not like other things like you, me, the rock, or, or the trees. He is a shay because he called himself that, but he's not like the shay that, of anything else. He is a that because the Prophet ﷺ, he refers to him as that as well. لا تتفكروا في ذات الله He warned us, don't contemplate about the that of Allah. You cannot understand it. But he used the word that when referring to, referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so we can use that word as well. But his that is not like anything else in existence. Devoid of the six directions, meaning now take the same understanding and apply it to Allah whenever he says, uses the word fawq for himself. Or he uses ma'a, he speaks about his ma'iyya. When he uses directions for himself, then we have the same sort of understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He uses these, but it's not like the usage that we use for anything else. So we don't give Allah a direction up, down, left, right, this way and that way, in the way that we use it for ourselves. He used it, we leave it at that. He called himself a shay, we leave it at that. He was referred to as that, we leave it at that. Ma'iyya, fawqiyya, all of these things are used for him, and we leave it at that. We don't understand it in the way we understand other things. وَلَيْسَ الْإِسْمُ غَيْرًا لِلْمُسَمَّى لَدَىٰ أَهْلِ الْبَصِيرَةِ خَيْرِ الْآلِ The name does not refer to other than the named as per the people of insight, the best of followers. This is not so much an aqidah point as it is really a refutation of the Mu'tazila. It's, a, it's kind of a, an intricate discussion, but basically there's the ism, there's the musamma, and then there's tasmiya. So there's the name, there's the thing being named, and then there's the naming. So there was this whole discussion that took place with the Mu'tazila over it. I think it's, it's more than we need to get into. But maybe the best way to take this is how Imam Razi wrote in his tafsir, rahimahullah, that this is a discussion which he considers to be useless. He says, everyone understands that a name is different than the one being named. Right? I might call a person an Asad, but it doesn't make him a lion. A name is one thing, and what I apply it to is something else. And the naming is the act of it. So, Imam Razi, he, on this particular line, or about this particular situation, this particular discussion, he says that the understanding is obvious to the lay person. There's no reason to get into it. So inshallah, I won't get into it uh, too much either. Best to just uh, leave it. وَمَا إِنْ جَوْهَرٌ رَبِّي وَجِسْمٌ 
وَلَا كُلٌّ وَبَعْضٌ ذُو اجْتِمَالِ My Lord is neither an element nor a compound. So an element would be the most simplest building block, the most simplest part. So before we used to think the atom was the most simplest part until we realized it was made up of other things. Then we thought those were the most simplest part until we realized that they too were made up of other things. But the word jawhar is used to just imply the most simple thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not an element, He is not this building block. Nor is He a jism, meaning He's not made up of building blocks. He is neither a sum. A sum means you take a third, you take a third, you take a third and you make a whole. He is not that. Nor is He a part. He is included in time or space, meaning He is not included in time and space. I don't think there's much that needs to be said about that. That's pretty in obvious for the Muslim. Rationally, the existence of an element is certain, one that is indivisible, O oh cousin of mine. This too is a, is a Kalami discussion. Uh, not too important for the for the realm of fiqh, uh, aqidah. But basically what he's saying is that this concept of a juz, of a piece, of an element as well, of an element, is something that is certain. The philosophers, for example, they denied its existence, uh, thought it was just something made up, a, a trick of the mind. But uh, the scholars of Islam said, no, this is a real thing. One that exists, it is not uh, divisible. And that's all that he's pointing out. وَمَا الْقُرْآنُ مَخْلُوقًا تَعَالَى كَلَامُ الرَّبِّ عَنْ جِنْسِ الْمَقَالِ The Qur'an isn't created beyond comparison the kalam of the Lord is to what is spoken. So those of us who have studied Islamic history, we know that there was a time when our scholars were tortured over this issue of the createdness of the Qur'an. And so he's pointing out that the Qur'an itself is not created. The word Qur'an can be used to mean two different things. The first thing that it refers to is the speech of Allah, the kalam of Allah, which is a sifa, a characteristic of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And being a sifa and characteristic of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it can't be created. Because if it was created, meaning it came later on in time, then it would apply a change to Allah. And as we said, that is an impossibility. Also, the kalam of Allah can have letters and words to it. The reason it can't have words to it is because when you write out a word, alif, then lam, then lam, you give time to it. This letter comes first, then this letter, then this letter. When you speak it, you speak it in the same way. And so the actual kalam of Allah can't have letters or words to it because it would necessitate a time in his pronunciation or in his reading, that too is an impossibility for Allah. So the actual Qur'an referring to the kalam, speech of Allah, is something that isn't created. Everything else is being written in the loh mahfuz, is being spoken by Jibreel alayhi salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam re reciting it to us, us reciting it afterwards, us writing it down, the rest of these things are obviously creations that come out of our mouth and come out of our hands. It, is not, it does not refer directly to the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he warns us that the this kalam of Allah is beyond any comparison to what is spoken by us. وَرَبُّ الْعَرْشِ فَوْقَ الْعَرْشِ لَكِنْ بِلَا وَصْفِ التَّمَكُّنِ وَاتِّصَالِ The Lord of the throne is above the throne, and I put above in quotations because the word that is being used is folk. Folk is used in the Quran, so it's okay to use that word, but above is a translation of the word. And if by above you are thinking space and direction, then that is not something that we attribute to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here, the Lord of the throne is above the throne, however, without the attribute of resting or joining. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the Arsh ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa that Allah the Rahman the Merciful is on the Arsh in the in istiwa in this manner of istiwa 
And so what he's explaining to us is that when Allah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this arsh, that his being on the throne is not the same as resting or being joined to it. The salaf, the earlier scholars, including Imam Hanifa himself, took the position of tafweed on this matter. Which means that they deferred the matter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't know what this means. What does istiwa mean? We don't know. We have no idea what the meaning of it is. We don't, normally when you say istiwa and you're related to a king on his throne, then we know that it means that the king is sitting on his throne. But this meaning is an impossibility for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the way of the salaf was to just do tafweed on the matter. Meaning, wallahu a'lam, we refer the meaning to him, we don't know. But what happened in later generations is that we had other deviant groups that have come into existence that said that Allah sits on the throne like a king sits on the throne. Or that Allah is encompassed by the throne as the king is encompassed by the throne. And in doing that, they have attributed things to Allah which are impossibilities. And at that point, some of our later scholars did what's called ta'wil. They did an interpretation of this towards a manner of istila which is uh, one of, that it refers to the dominion and the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, much like we say the Queen of England sits upon her throne, meaning not that she is literally upon her throne, but that she has, this is her kingdom that she is looking over. She has that position. Is that clear? I think most people have probably heard that, especially the students. وَمَتْ تَشْبِيهُ لِلْرَحْمَانِ وَجْهًا فَصُنْ أَنْذَاكَ أَصْنَافَ الْأَهَالِ There is no path to similarity with the All-Merciful, so don't attribute this to the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. In the Qur'an we find mutashabihat statements, like istiwa, like fawq, or like the yad of Allah, where there's some ayat that aren't entirely clear to us. So a person might ask, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's the purpose of this? What's the benefit of mentioning things in the Quran that we cannot understand? And the scholars write to that saying, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He does this, one of the wisdoms of it, is to make it clear to us how weak we are, how limited our intelligence is, our intellect is. You know, I once uh, was sitting with a sheikh and he told me, he said, whenever you give a talk, every now and then throw out a line that goes over everyone's head. He said, the reason you do that is you let them know your position and their position. That there's things that they don't understand. And so it, and oftentimes people like that. They like to be put in a position Otherwise, they start feeling like they know just as much as the speaker does. And so they, you, one of the ways of doing that is you throw out something, you know they won't understand it, but you throw it out there. And in a way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He throws out these mutashabihat ayat to put us in our place. That you don't know a lot of things. You cannot understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the way for you is one of obedience, one of being an abd, and just say that Allah knows and I don't. Allah has the knowledge and I don't. So rather than questioning everything and trying to understand the wisdom behind everything, and trying to understand reasoning and rationality behind everything, every now and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you can't. And it's a lesson for us to take. Why, why is he saying? Meaning, uh, he's, if you, the implication here is that if you come across a group that does tashbih to Allah, who says that, for example, Allah sits upon the throne, meaning sitting, or Allah has a hand, but we don't know how many fingers it has, something ridiculous like this, then know that these people are not from the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah.
So we'll just stop here. Okay. So stop from Maghrib, inshallah. The plan is to come back afterwards. And inshallah, we'll finish. Okay. Jazakumullah khair. <laughs> Possibly, I mean, I don't I haven't read the commentary. Would this possibly be Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad wa barik wa sallam So we'll continue from page 9 And uh, I think more or less we'll just read through for the sake of time Because, because dinner وَلَا يَمْضِي عَلَى الدَّيَّانِ دَيَّانِ وَقْتٌ وَأَزْمَانٌ وَأَحْوَالٌ بِحَالِ No moment passes over the dominator, dayyan, dominator, nor time, nor any of the states of creation. So I think at this point this is very clear to everybody, that time doesn't apply to Allah because He is the creator of it, nor does space apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He is the creator of that as well. So just like time, space is something that came into creation later, and so if Allah were to occupy that space, then that would mean that a change occurred. So before the creation of space, Allah was, and then after the creation of space, He was in the creation. This would imply a change, and that is an impossibility. وَمُسْتَغْنٍ إِلَاهِ عَنْ نِسَاءٍ وَأَوْلَادٍ إِنَاثٍ أَوْ رِجَالِ My God is not in need of a wife and children, be they females or males. So Allah is mustaghni, He is free. And here it means that He is free of needing a wife, or even free of taking a wife, would be the proper understanding of it. Because a person could argue, the difference between the two, is that a person can say, I am not in need of a wife, but I'm going to take one anyway. Right? Whereas what we're saying about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He is free of taking a wife. This is not something that He would ever do, nor is something that would be even acceptable uh, for his position. Same thing with children, be they male or female, irregardless. كَذَا عَنْ كُلِّ ذِي عَوْنٍ وَنَصْرٍ تَفَرَّدَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَذُو الْمَعَالِ Similarly, he isn't in need of an assistant or a helper. The majestic and the exalted is one and alone. This is just a continuation of needing a wife, needing a children, assistant, or helper. يُمِيتُ الْخَلْقَ قَحْرًا ثُمَّ يُحْيِي فَيَجْزِيهِمْ عَلَى وَفْقِ الْخِصَالِ He forces death on creation, then he gives them life, so he can reward them according to their habits. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives everything death. Whether they like it or not, it is not a decision that He allows them to make. And He gives them life afterwards, meaning after death, so that He can reward them in the hereafter, according to their habits. So as I mentioned earlier, that He's going through step by step all of the things that are mandatory for every single person to believe. So, so كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَ فان, Everything will come to an end. That is a belief that we have for every living being, with some exceptions. For example, Imam Abu Hanifa said that the Hur'een, they won't die. Uh, they are accepted, exception to this rule, and a couple other exceptions are mentioned as well. لِأَهْلِ الْخَيْرِ جَنَّاتٌ وَنُعْمَةٌ وَلِلْكُفَّارِ إِدْرَاكٌ نَكَالِ For the people of good, there are gardens and blessings, and for the disbelievers, there are punishments, and trials. 
So similarly, there were groups who, that came about who denied that there would be uh, these kind of, that Jannah and Jahannam are, are not real. And he continues, وَلَا يَفْنَ الْجَحِيمُ وَلَا الْجِنَانُ وَلَا أَهْلُهُمَا أَهْلُ انْتِقَالِ Jannah and Jahannam will never cease and their inhabitants will not be removed. So there have been groups that have come who have said that, for example, Jahannam will come to an end, that eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy it, either taking out everyone from it or destroying them in the process. But the belief of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that Jannah and Jahannam have already exist, even now, and that they, they and their inhabitants will continue to exist forever afterwards. Although we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pull the believers in Jahannam out and place them into Jannah, where they will stay forever. I said earlier that there's no infinity into the past. And inshallah you all understood that. Why can there be an infinity into the future? Right. So it's the same thing with the future, there's never an ending. Right. So why can't there? I'm saying we said that there cannot be something that never had a beginning. Obviously, with the exception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the necessity of it and the fact that He's not in time. But then, how can there be something that will continue forever? Jannah, Jahannam, and its inhabitants. Everything that starts must have an end. That is true. But rationally, how does that make sense? I Meaning, right now we're saying there is no end here. <coughs> right? Right. But that won't happen. So we're saying they will go on for infinity. There is no end. Is there time in Jannah and Jahannam? What is time then? Time is basically movement, right? If something moves, then time applies to it. If something went from point A to point B, it can only do that if time occurred in between. So this concept of change in time obviously still exi exists even in Jannah and Jahannam. So there's a difference between an infinity that has completely come to uh, it has completely come to into existence versus one that hasn't. Meaning, when you talk about infinity that goes into the past, it has completed itself now. Understand? For it started forever, but eventually came and it completed itself now. So what is called in the in the term in the terminology an actualized infinity. An infinity that actualized, meaning it actually completed. That is an impossibility for the reasons we talked about. But one that is a potential infinity, something that might go on forever, but it never actually reaches forever, that is certainly possible. So when we talk about it in the back, in the, in the past, then we're saying that it started infinity but eventually finished. That's called an actualized infinity. That is an impossibility. Infinity can't finish. But one that continues and never quite reaches infinity, that is certainly possible. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will inshallah sustain us in that way. يَرَاهُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ بِغَيْرِ كَيْفٍ وَإِذْرَاكٍ وَضَرْبٍ مِنْ مِثَالِ The believers will see him without any means, encompassment, and any similarity. Meaning, they will see him without any means, without any encompassment, and without any similarity. So we know that for the believers in the Akhirah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, وَجُوهٌ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ نَاظِرَةٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ That they will be looking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That this is a gift for the believers in the Akhirah. But He also says, لَا تُدْرِكُهُ الْأَبْصَارِ that the sight cannot 
encompass him. It cannot see him. It cannot encompass him would probably be a better translation. So the point he's trying to make is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that we will see him. We will see him. The howness of that seeing, that is something that we can't really explain. We know that it won't involve any means. It won't involve any encompassment. You won't be able to see him in his entirety. And there's no similarity to that vision that we can even comprehend. So that's what he's trying to say. That there is a scene because there are some people, the Mu'tazila for example, that denied that we will be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They denied the possibility of it. So, did he say this? Yeah, he does. Okay. So I'll get to that in the next line. The scholars had some interesting discussions on this issue. Do the Mala'ika get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well? And they said, yes, they do. That's the majority opinion. Do the jinn, the believing jinn, do they get to see him as well? And yes, they do. Some of them, uh, yeah, they argued about these, these things. But as I mentioned, there were some groups that said no. It's impossible. How can we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So he says to them, فَيَنْسُونَ النَّعِيمَ إِذَا رَأَوْهُ فَيَا خُسْرَانَ أَهْلِ اَعْتِزَالِ Thus they forget the blessings of Jannah when they see him. O people, save, yourself from the save yourselves from the loss of the Mu'tazili. So the ulama have said that the Mu'tazili, because they deny being able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter, they won't be able to. The Mu'tazila for the most part are considered to be, they're a deviant group, I don't want to get into too much, they're basically rationalist. So what they did is they put rationalism, the intellect, on the same level as wahi. So if, if something in wahi didn't make sense to them, rationally, they said, that's not possible. So obviously we know the falsehood of that, we understand the limitations of the int intellect, that so there are things that we cannot understand, and so we leave it when it comes to that, and we go with wahi because that's yaqini. But the Mu'tazila said that the seeing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an impossibility, therefore it would not happen. The scholars re replied that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in a hadith Qudsi, أَنَا عِنْدَ ظَنِّي عَبْدِي بِي that I will, be with my, I will be with my servant the way he imagines me or the way he thinks of me. So if he thinks he won't be able to see me, guess what? He won't be able to see me. So those are the Mu'tazila that make it to Jannah. They might get the other rewards, but they will be, they will be a mahroom. They will be taken away from this particular reward. وَمَا إِنْ فِعْلٌ أَصْلَحُ ذَفْتِرَادٍ عَلَى الْهَادِ الْمُقْدَسِ ذِي التَّعَالِي The most beneficial action is not obligated. I missed a line here. The most beneficial action is not obligated on the guide, the pure, the exalted. The Mu'tazila also said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obligated to do what is best for, his, for us, for His creation. An obligation meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have a choice. He has to do what is best for us. And the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah replied that there is nothing that is forced upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he wants to do good for his servant, he can do that. If he doesn't, he doesn't have to do that. So this line that's missing here. The most beneficial action is not obligated on the guide, al hadi the pure, muqaddasi, the ta'ali, the exalted. So on the guide, the pure, the exalted. وَفَرْضٌ لَازِمٌ تَصْدِيقُ رُسُلٍ وَأَمْلَاكٍ كِرَامٍ بِالنَّوَالِ A vowel of the messengers, meaning tasdiq of the messengers, is necessarily obligated. And that's showing ta'akid that you have to accept the messengers and of the angels who are honored with blessings. وَالْخَتْمُ الرُّسُلِ بِالصَّدْرِ الْمَعَلَّةِ نَبِيٍّ هَاشِمِيٍّ ذِي الْجَمَالِ So وَالْخَتْمُ الرُّسُلِ بِالصَّدْرِ بِالصَّدْرِ الْمُعَلَّةِ 
Nabiyyin Hashimiyin Vi Jamali. The end of the messengers is with the first, the exalted, a Hashimi prophet, one of magnificence. He says, Khatmur Rusuli bis Sadr. Sadr means like the chest. And so here's being used in a way of uh, like metaphorical to mean either sharaf of honorable nobleness or in the meaning of being the first. So either translation would be fine. I, I prefer just putting it as the first because it, contra it contrasts later with the, the last. So the end of the messengers is with the first of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He informed us that he was the first that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created, meaning he was a Nabi even before Adam alayhi salam, while he was still between water and teen. And then he's Hashimi and one of magnificence. Imam al anbiyai bila ikhtilafin wa taj al asfiyai bila ikhtilali. He is the Imam of the Prophets without any disagreement and the crown of the people of purity without any blemish. وَبَاقٍ شَرْعُهُ فِي كُلِّ وَقْتٍ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ وَارْتِحَالِ His sharia remains for every single time until the day of judgment and return. This is to say that once the Prophet ﷺ came with his sharia, it will never be abrogated to the point that even when Isa ﷺ comes and joins this ummah, he will be from among the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam following the Sharia of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَحَقٌ أَمْرُ مِعْرَاجٍ وَصِدْقٌ فَفِيهِ نَصُّ أَخْبَارٍ عَوَالِي The incident of Mi'raj is certain and true for there are authenticated narrations about it. You find some scholars that say about Mi'raj obviously about Isra that is from Qur'an, so it's clear, but about Mi'raj, some of the scholars have said that the narrations about it are mass transmitted. Others have said that they are mashhur. Either way, the belief in it is obligatory upon believers. وَمَرْجُوٌ شَفَاءَةُ أَهْلِ خَيْرٍ لِأَصْحَابِ الْكَبَائِرِ كَالْجِبَالِ The intercession of the good ones is anticipated for the people of grave sins, like the mountains. Actually, let me take that back. When it comes to the incident of Mi'raj, the statements about it are mashhur, but according to the Maturidiya, it's if a person who denies Mi'raj, he won't be called a kafir, but rather he will be a person of bid'ah. Whereas for Isra, it's not true because that's in the Qur'an, that person will have done kufr by denying it. The intercession of the good ones is anticipated, meaning the anbiya and the awliya, for the people of grave sins, like the mountains. وَإِنَّ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ لَفِي أَمَانٍ عَنِ الْإِصْيَانِ عَمَدًا وَنْعِزَالِ Indeed, the prophets are surely protected from purposeful disobedience and dismissal. So the anbiya are protected, they're ma'asum, from disobedience. According to the Maturidiyya, they are protected from any sins, be they large or small, be they purposeful or accidental. The other group of the Ahlu Sunnah, the Asha'ira, held the opinion that they are capable of making mistakes, which would be like a small sin in they are capable of making small mistakes by accident for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would correct them. Our scholars, they put the two together and said that the, under, the proper understanding of it would be that scholars, that anbiya may sometimes do things that are not sins, nor are they even mistakes, but they are khilaf, khilaf awla, they could have done some, that was good, but they could have done something better. You guys understand? There's two groups of, among the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the Maturidiyah, said that even for, everyone agrees, big sins, not possible. Sins on purpose, small sins, not possible. 
The disagreement is whether small sin is done by accident, is that possible or not? The Maturidiyya have said that's not possible for the Anbiya. The Asha'ira have said that it is a possibility as long as it doesn't lead to some sort of vile action that people would look down upon it. So they put a condition on it. Our scholars have put the two together and said that they are capable of doing something whereas uh, capable of doing a good whereas a better action had existed. So it's not doing something wrong, it's not sinning, it's none of that. They did a good action, but a better action was possible. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would correct them. And then uh, they are protected from purposeful disobedience and dismissal. So purposeful disobedience, that's where he's putting down his opinion. And then dismissal, meaning once a person is a prophet, they are never taken, that prophethood cannot be taken away from them. وَمَا كَانَتْ نَبِيٍ قَدْتُ أُنْثَى وَلَا عَبْدٌ وَشَخْصٌ ذُفْتِ عَالِي A woman has never been a prophet, nor a slave, or a man of falsities. Some of the scholars spoke about whether or not some women throughout history like Maryam السلام, and others have, were prophets or not. The majority opinion of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that a woman has not been a prophet, nor a slave, uh, nor a man of falsities, meaning one who is not trustworthy or one that is capable of lying. Uh, this is because the Anbiya have a job that exposes them to sometimes the worst of people, difficult situations, life-threatening situations, and they need to be people that are completely respected by everyone in their community. And so this has been uh, the condition that has been placed upon uh, them being a prophet. So prophets have never been from other groups, other than men, free men, free honest men. وَذُو الْقَرْنَيْنِ لَمْ يُعْرَفْ نَبِيًّا كَذَا لُقْمَانُ فَهْذَرْ عَنْ جِدَالِ ذُو الْقَرْنَيْنِ was not known to be a prophet, likewise Luqman was not known to be a prophet, so refrain from disagreement. And the same thing the scholars disagreed on this. وَعِيسَى سَوْفَ يَأْتِي ثُمَّ يُتْوِي لِلْدَجَّالٍ شَقِيٍّ ذِي خَبَالِ Isa alayhi salam will soon arrive to destroy the jal, the wretched, the corrupt. So as I mentioned, he's listing out the things that are mandatory for us to believe. So a person who denies the descent of Isa, who denies the existence of the jal, tries to explain it away in a metaphorical stance, this is not the position of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. كَرَامَاتُ الْوَلِي بِدَارِ دُنْيَا لَهَا كَوْنٌ فَهُمْ أَهْلُ النَّوَالِ The, the wali's miracles in this world are real, for they are people of blessings. The miracle of a wali is a proof for the prophet of that wali. As I mentioned earlier, a mu'jiza is something where a person comes and he claims prophethood. This is the condition for a mu'ajiza. The person, number one, he claims prophethood. And number two, that miracle that gets done, it's a proof for his prophethood. So it stands as a witness for him. Whereas a wali doesn't claim prophethood. So if a wali does a miracle, we don't say, oh, he's a, he's a nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He never claimed it. So a karama are real things that are given to walis as gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in fact, they are a proof for the prophets that they follow. وَلَمْ يَفْضُلْ وَلِيٌّ قَطُّ دَهْرًا نَبِيًّا أَوْ رُسُولًا فِي فِنْتِهَالِ No wali has ever excelled in superiority over a prophet or a messenger in his claims. So, the, obviously, I think most people know that the prophets are at the highest stature and degree of humankind. And after that come the awliya, and among the awliya are the companions. And he speaks about them next. He says, وَلِسْتَدِّيقِ رُجْحَانٌ جَلِيٌّ عَلَى الْأَصْحَابِ مِنْ غَيْرِ احْتِمَالِ The Siddiq, meaning Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, has a rank clearly above all the companions, no doubt. وَلِلْفَارُوقِ رُجْحَانٌ وَفَضْلٌ عَلَىٰ أُثْمَانَ ذِي النُّورَيْنِ عَالِي The Faruq, meaning Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab has a rank and excellence 
above and beyond Uthman, Dhun-Nurayn, Dhun-Nurayn referring to his having married two daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. وذنورين حقا كان خيرا من الكرار في صف القتال ذنورين is rightfully greater than the karar in the ranks of war. Karar is someone who repeatedly comes back and fights, referring to Sayyidina Ali radiallahu an. So he's laid out the position of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that this is the ranking of the four uh, khulafa. وللكرار فضل بعد هذا على الأغيار طرا لا تبالي. After them, meaning the three, the Karrar, Sayyidina Ali has an excellence over everybody else that comes afterwards. Do not be concerned, meaning do not be concerned with what other people have to say. وللصديقة الرجحان ثعلم على الزهراء في بعض الخلال. Know that the Siddiqa Aisha radiallahu anha has a rank above the Zahra Fatima radiallahu anha, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in some qualities. So there was a discussion among the scholars about who is at a higher rank, Aisha or Fatima radiallahu anhuma, and so he doesn't take a stance on either one, but he says that there are some things for which Aisha is known. For example, her narrating hadith and her, uh, her knowledge of fiqh and that there are other things in which Fatima radiallahu anha has a rank in that for example the Prophet ﷺ referred to her as a part of him and that should be sufficient for her rank وَلَمْ يَلْعَنْ يَزِيدًا بَعْدَ مَوْتٍ سِوَى الْمِكْثَارِ فِي الْإِغْرَاءِ غَالِي No one cursed Yazid after his death except those exceeding bounds excessively this too is something the scholars disagreed upon about what is the situation of Yazid. We find some of the scholars who held it com completely permissible to curse Yazid, and they did. And we saw other scholars who said that he has passed to his Rabb, there's no reason for it. This is because of his, his uh, alleged uh, killing of the grandson of the Prophet The author here is taking the stance that what, what has, that Essentially, we cannot be entirely sure that he is the one who ordered the killing. And so, for that reason, it's best to hold our tongue and not say anything about it. وَإِمَانُ الْمُقَلِّدِ ذُو اعْتِبَارٍ بِأَنْوَاعِ الدَّلَاءِ لِي كَالنِّصَالِ The blind follower's belief is acceptable by such proofs clear-cut like a sword's blade. So scholars had this disagreement that is it okay to have taqlid in, iman, in Islam, meaning in the belief of Islam? Is it okay to be a muqallid in Iman? Or does one know, need to know the proofs for it? So if a person is a Muslim because he was raised by Muslims, and he lived his life being a Muslim, prayed, did everything, and he passed away, is that acceptable? Or did he have to go and learn the proofs for Islam? learn the proofs for the existence of Allah and the messengership of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the belief of the, the ahlu sunnah wal jamaa generally hold that the muqallid his belief is completely acceptable we are not mandated to learn the proofs unless of course a person starts having doubts then at that point it becomes obligatory for that person that they go and learn the proofs for their deen they ask their local scholar they ask their local imam if they don't get a sufficient answer then they keep going and they find someone until they do وَمَا عُذْرٌ لِذِي I mean, that being said, we see this, this disease nowadays where somebody has a doubt about their deen, they ask their parent, the parent can't give a good answer, and then, okay, there's no answer, I'm done. Or they go to the local imam, and the imam doesn't answer to their satisfaction, they say, okay, there's no answer, I'm done. It's obligatory on a person that if he starts having doubts about his iman, that he rectify it, he find the answers, he find the people that can rectify it for him. And you know, there is there are scholars who are capable of doing this. وَمَا عُذْرٌ لِذِي أَقْلٍ بِجَهْلٍ بِخَلَّاقِ الْأَسَافِلِ وَالْأَعَالِ One of intelligence has no excuse for ignorance of the creator of everything, low and high. This is the stance of Imam Abu Hanifa as mentioned earlier, that a person who is aqil and baligh he is mandated to, rec to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no excuse for him 
uh, once he has that level of intelligence and maturity. So anyone who does not die is the death of a kafir. وَمَا إِيمَانُ شَخْصٍ هَالَ بَأْسٍ بِمَقْبُولٍ لِفَقْدِ الْإِمْتِثَالِ A person's believing at death is not accepted due to lacking obedience. So a person who just believes at the very point of death, meaning he is in, he's seeing the malaika before him, and then he accepts Islam, that is not accepted for him. What needs to come with Iman is a firm belief, is a firm intention to act upon that belief for eternity. So when a person accepts Islam, he's not only accepting Islam, but he's accepting that I will now live with this belief forever. He might die the next minute without knowing that he was going to die, but he has to have that intention that I am a Muslim forever now. Whereas a person who's looking at death, he sees the malaika, he doesn't have that intention. And so it's not accepted from him. وَمَا أَفْعَالُ خَيْرٍ فِي حِسَابٍ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ مَفْرُودَ الْوِصَالِ Good actions are not accounted for in belief. The two must come together. So according to the Maturidiyya and the Hanafiya, actions are not a part of Iman. Those are two separate things. Yes, actions, good actions, beautify your Iman. So a person becomes a believer by saying the Kalima and having that intention in their heart. They become a believer. That person is a believer. After that, whatever good actions he or she does, it only beautifies that Iman that he or she has. But still, the two must come together, meaning a person is not to have one and leave the other. وَلَا يُقْضَى بِكُفْرٍ وَارْتِدَادٍ بِأَحْرٍ أَوْ بِقَتْلٍ وَاخْتِزَالٍ A ruling of disbelief and apostasy is not passed for fornication or murder or oppression. So a person does not become a kafir or a murtad simply because they do something that is haram. So the action itself makes that person a sinner, but it doesn't take them out of Islam or Iman. Except as we know, if a person accept, accepts that action to be halal when it's haram, then that can take them out of Iman. So to consider something that is haram to be halal, meaning to deny what is in the Qur'an or Tawat or Hadith, then that will take that person out of Islam. But the act of doing it will not. وَمَنْ يَنْوِي إِرْتِدَادًا بَعْدَ دَهْرٍ يَصِرْ عَنْ دِينِ حَقٍ ذَنْ سِلَالِ Whoever intends apostasy later on has silently left the deen of truth now. So this is that person who says, I will become a kafir tomorrow. Right now I'm a believer. Or I'll be a believer as long as I live with my parents. Once I leave, then I won't be. A person who is content with leaving deen in the future, that person has no deen now. A person who is, tells himself that I will leave Islam later, he has left his Islam right at that point, not later. It, it's not possible that Iman can coexist with, kufr, with the intent of kufr. Because to have Iman is to have complete belief in that system without, um, without any doubt, and that doubt will be there if he is intending kufr later. وَلَفْضُ الْكُفْرِ You know, I'm saying these things and maybe some of you guys are thinking, who does this? What kind of person thinks like this? But I will tell you, I've met many people like this. Who have said things like this. Who, who uh, have ideas about Islam and future date. And I'm not just making these words up when I say, oh, when I leave my parents home, then I will stop being a Muslim. People have these thoughts, people think this way. And so this isn't just something that's theoretical from somebody uh, centuries ago. This is happening now. وَلَفْضُ الْكُفْرِ مِنْ غَيْرِ اِعْتِقَادٍ بِتَوْعٍ رَدُّ دِينٍ بِغْتِفَالِ The hypocritical word of disbelief freely removes deen even unknowingly. So according to Allah Ushi, the person who says a word of disbelief without even believing in it, 
So he says a statement of kufr, freely, not being coerced into it. But he doesn't really believe it, it's not in his heart, but he says it, that this person has left the deen, even though he doesn't realize it. وَلَا يُحْكَمْ بِكُفْرٍ حَالَ سُكْرٍ بِمَا يَهْذِي وَيَلْغُوا بِرْتِجَالِ A ruling of disbelief is not passed on an inebriate, meaning somebody who's drunk, due to impromptu gibberish and blundering speech. So a person who is intoxicated to the point of intoxication, meaning he can't tell the sky from the earth, he can't tell a woman from a man, he's completely intoxicated. That this person, if he says something that is kufr, out of the gibberish, the nonsense that drunks tend to say, and the blundering speech, meaning the nonsense that they tend to say, that this person is not considered to be a kafir. وَمَا الْمَعْدُومُ مَرْئِيًّا وَشَيْئًا لِفِقْحٍ لَاحَ فِي يُمْنِ الْحِلَالِ Nothingness is neither visible nor existing due to insight clear as the moon's light. This is a bit more abstract. This is referring back that there were some philosophers who thought that nothingness was something. That nothingness was something. Anyone here have a science background? Physics? So Khalid. <laughs> this refers to, like we could use this today for quantum mechanics. The scholars, the scientists that try to say that in a quantum vacuum, you can have something that comes from nothing. So they're referring to something as being nothing, but in fact it's not truly nothing. But they're calling it a nothing. So there were philosophers in the past that did the same thing. That they would say that even nothing is something. And so Allah existed and nothing existed at the same time. This something that is called nothing existed at the same time. And that nothing is where everything came from. So again, if you don't understand that, that's fine. But uh, the point I want to make is that nowadays, uh, atheists and, and physicists will make this argument. There's something very similar to it, but according to our time. وَغَيْرَانِ الْمُكَوَّنُ لَا كَشَيْءٍ مَعَ التَّكْوِينِ خُذْهُ لِكْتِحَالِ The two are different, not the same. The created and creating. Take it to sharpen the mind. This is what we talked about earlier. That Actually, we didn't talk about that. The created and the creating. So the, the one that is created and the act of creation are two different things. Take it to sharpen the mind. This is also a very deep discussion that has to do with uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's takhliq versus the makhluq and uh, what the relationship between the two of them are. Uh, we won't get into it today. It's a lengthy discussion. وَإِنَّ السُّحْتَ رِزْقٌ مِثْلُ حِلٍ وَإِنْ يَكْرَهْ مَقَالِي كُلُّ قَالِي Indeed, the illicit is a, is a sustenance like the licit, even if each rival dislikes my statement. What Alama Ushi is saying is that whether you eat, if you eat haram, that is still a form of risk, although it's sinful to do it. Whereas if you eat halal, that too is a form of risk. He's trying to make a point that the haram, some people held the opinion that it's not a form of risk, that there is absolutely no benefit in it, uh, rulings are not derived from it, and, 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 this, and so on. He's saying that according to us, haram does provide risk, but the disobedience of that risk and the harm of that risk is, is separate. So inshallah, I'm just going to finish up and then we'll, if there's any questions, we'll take it afterwards. Is that okay? وَفِي الْأَجْزَاثِ عَنْ تَوْحِيدِ رَبِّي سَيُّبْلَى كُلُّ شَخْصٍ بِالسُؤَالِ Within the graves about my Lord's Tawheed, each person will be tried through questioning. Meaning from Munkar and Nakir. وَلِلْكُثَّارِ One thing uh, to mention here, that it's not necessarily that a person be within a grave, that even if a person is eaten by a lion, or cut up to pieces, or dissolved in acid, that he doesn't find a way to escape from this questioning. Decreed for the disbelievers and the sinners 
is the grave's torment due to their evil deeds. And as I mentioned, there are scholars, there are not scholars, there are groups that uh, completely negated and, dis and uh, they completely negated the concept of punishment in the grave. So he's showing us that the Ahl Sunnah wal, wal Jama'ah completely believe in this. دخول الناس في الجنة فضل من الرحمن يا أهل الأمال. The people's entrance into Jannah is a favor from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, from the All Merciful, O people of hope. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He does not owe Jannah to any of us, no matter how good you are. His giving it to us is a fadl. In reality, if He were to act on His adl, on His justice, then He would He could easily throw us all into Jahannam. حساب الناس بعد البعث حق فكونوا بالتحرز عن وبالي. The people's reckoning after rise, arising is certain, so save yourself from the outcome of sin. So the hisab of people after being resurrected is certain. So he's warning us: save yourself from the wabal. Wabal here referring to the harm and the punishment that comes from sinning. وَيُعْطَى الْكُتُبُ بَعْضَ النَّحْوَ يُمْنَ وَبَعْضَ النَّحْوَ ظَهْرٍ وَالشِّمَالِ The books are given to some from the right, meaning those who do good, and to some from behind or the left to those who do bad. وَحَقٌ وَزْنُ أَعْمَالٍ وَجَرْيٌ عَلَى مَتْنِ الصِّرَاتِ بِلَا اتِبَالِ The weighing of certain of deeds is certain, and the passing over the deck of the bridge, meaning the sirat, is also certain. The bridge that goes across Jahannam, that we all will pass over. وَمَرْجُوٌ شَفَاعَةُ أَهْلِ خَيْرٍ لِأَصْحَابِ الْكَبَائِرِ كَالْجِبَالِ The intercession of good people is hoped for those of grave sins like mountains. وَلِلْدَعْوَاتِ تَأْثِيرٌ بَلِيغٌ وَقَدْ يَنْفِيهِ أَصْحَابُ الضَّلَالِ Supplications have a far-reaching effect. Those who misguidance sometimes deny it. You know, sometimes people will say that how can dua have any benefit? If everything is decreed for us and everything is written for us, then what benefit is dua? And the belief of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and what Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have told us is that dua has a benefit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, make dua, I will accept it. The, the way to think about this is the way that we think about destiny. We, are all, we all have a rizq that is promised to us. The fool is the one who sits in one place and says the rizq should come to me. And the smart one is the one who says, I will go and find my rizq. The fool is the one who says, if I'm destined for Jannah, then I won't do anything. I'll just sit here and I'll get it. And the wise one is the one who goes out and seeks his Jannah, not knowing what's written for him. In the same way, the fool is the one who says, I won't make dua because it's already written. Whereas the smart one, he says that I will go make dua, I will seek it out so that I will get what is written for me because I don't know what's written for me. وَدُنْيَانَا حَدِيثٌ وَالْحَيُولَ عَدِيمُ الْكَوْنِ فَاسْمَعْ بِجْتِذَالِ Our world is originated and the primordial does not exist, so listen with pleasure. Allah is Qadim, that we've established. That means everything other than Allah is Hadith. It came into existence, it originated. There was a time when it didn't exist and then Allah brought it into existence. So he's stating the fact, وَدُنْيَانَ حَدِيثٌ Then this concept of the primordial, the hayula, there were some of the philosophers that held this opinion that there was the primordial, call it the Big Bang, call it whatever you want, it's always existed. That that thing was eternal, it's pre-eternal. So he says that pre primordial that they talk about, it doesn't exist, it never existed. So listen with pleasure, I meaning don't worry yourself over what the philosophers say. وَلِلْجَنَّاتِ وَالنِّرَانِ كَوْنٌ عَلَيْهَا مَرُّ أَحْوَالٍ خَوَالِ The gardens and the fires already exist. Many periods have passed over them. 
You know this we already spoke about. وَذُو الْإِيمَانِ لَا يَبْقَى مُقِيمًا بِشُؤْمِ الذَّنْبِ فِي دَارِ اشْتِعَالِ The believer will not remain stationed in the place of fire from sin's calamity. So the believer will eventually be taken out of Jahannam and placed into Jannah. And then this is the conclusion. The author says for himself, لَقَدْ أَلْبَسْتُ لِلتَّوْحِيدِ نَظْمًا بَدِيءَ الشَّكْلِ كَالسِّحْرِ الْحَلَالِ Indeed, I've garbed Tawheed in a poetic form, and a form of marvel like permitted magic. So like magic is something that amazes people, in that way this too is amazing, except this is permissible. يُسَلِّ الْقَلْبَ كَالْبُشْرَ بِالْرَوْحٍ وَيُحِي الْرُوحَ كَالْمَاءِ الزُّلَالِ Like good news, it consoles the heart with ease, and like fresh water, it gives life to the soul. فَخُوذُوا فِيهِ حِفْظًا وَاعْتِقَادًا تَنَالُوا جِنْسَ أَصْنَافِ الْمَنَالِ So take it to memorize and believe, you will gain special blessings in both worlds. You know, Mutun used to be memorized before. وَكُونُوا عَوْنَ هَذَا الْعَبْدِ دَهْرًا بِذِكْرِ الْخَيْرِ فِي حَالِ ابْتِهَالِ Help the slave in each and every moment through your good words in supplication, meaning make dua for the author. لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ يَعْفُوهُ بِفَضْلٍ وَيُعْطِيهِ السَّعَادَةَ فِي الْمَالِ Perhaps Allah forgives him through grace, his fadl, and gives him bliss in the hereafter. وَإِنِّ الدَّهْرَ عَدْعُوا كُنْهَا وُسْعِي لِمَنْ بِالْخَيْرِ يَوْمًا قَدْ دَعَالِي Indeed, I ask throughout my life with my utmost for one who supplicated for me even a day. So inshallah, if uh, anyone finds mistakes in this, please let me know. And uh, I encourage you, mashallah, Mufti Atif went to the, the trouble of making this very nice booklet. So read it over a few times and as the author said, make dua for him at the end. Make dua for me as well, inshallah. And may, may Allah forgive all of our sins, accept this time that we spent and, uh, and bring us together in Jannah, inshallah. Take questions now, Eid. Okay. So inshallah, if the sisters have any questions, they can write it down, send it over. And if anyone else here has questions, we'll, we'll do that for a, a few minutes. Inshallah. Also, uh, I want to remind her about the survey, complete survey. Oh, uh, for the sisters as well, there's a survey. So make sure that you complete it. Uh, don't leave it. How do you disprove what? Nothing is something. Nothing is something. How do you, the question is, how do you disprove that nothing is something? We, it's by definition. So by definition, when we refer to nothing, when we say there was nothing with Allah, then we mean by that the true definition of nothingness. The absolutely nothing. So it's something that's difficult to uh, comprehend. By nothing, I don't mean sp empty space. I mean not even space. So it's not a concept that we're used to. As beings of time and space, that's, all, that's what we know. So the comprehension of an absolute nothing is not something that we can necessarily do. So if you imagine a nothing, that's still a something. So we're, we're not even talking about that. We're saying that were, there was Allah and nothing else in the true sense of nothingness. So like even space... You leave, this, you leave the atmosphere and you go to space, that's still something. Right? That's still space. It's, it's an area. And we're not even talking about that. Even the absence of that. One of the interesting things about Einstein, you know, he gets praised a lot. Uh, if you look at his, his theory of special relativity, basically, basically what he does in that is he shows that there's a, 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 a relationship between time and space. But more importantly to me, what he does there is he shows that time and space change and that they expand and they contract. And there, were, there are times when there are no space and time. 
So scientifically, he proves this. But what's really amazing is that a thousand years ago, our scholars already told us this. We already knew this. But rather, he just brought it out in a way where scientifically it was proven. So his theory added nothing to our yaqeen. It added nothing to us. We already knew all this. So for example, they'll say that at the, you, you come to the edge of the universe, what's after that is nothing. Meaning in the true sense of nothing. There's no space after that. And so this concept, that, that's already there. This is what we mean by nothingness. Actually, I, 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 she actually showed me this earlier, so I already answered it. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? So let me then uh, just emphasize one point. that rationality, these kind of arguments that the scholars showed us, this is a crutch. It's a crutch, meaning it, it helps support you until, meaning it's not what you really should be. A believer walks on his two feet. A believer walks on his two feet. And what I mean by that is when Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have told us something, we accept that period. All these arguments are unnecessary for the believer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it, that's it. I don't need to understand it. I don't need to know the wisdom behind it. I'm an abd at the end of the day. So when a believer walks on his two feet, that means he walks in the path of the sharia, the path of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But the scholars have found throughout time that there is people who, are, who need crutch, who need crutches. You know what crutches are? The things that you help you, help you walk. And so for a time, maybe your iman is weak. Maybe you're still kind of under, trying to understand something. Maybe you're in a hardship. Maybe the shaitan, your nafs, whatever the case might be. And so you need that crutch to help you. This is what this is. This is a crutch. This is not the asal. This is just to get you on your feet so that eventually you start walking on your own. So every believer has to find a path that eventually puts them on their two feet. That will come through ilm. That will come through ihsan. That will come through suhba. And every believer needs to seek those things out. And obviously there's people here who are much more qualified than me to speak on this topic. But uh, it's something that I feel that uh, having given this type of talk and spending a lot of time talking about logic and reasoning, that I make it clear to you that this is for the people, this is for the one like me who is deficient. This is not the, not the goal. Eventually you need to move past this and you need the suhbah of the awliya and and the, the ulama and to reach that state. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give it to all of us. Can you make dua? I'm not a dua person. I'm not a dua person. Go ahead. It was, it was, the question is about uh, perennialism or pluralism which is a belief that multiple religions can be true, or multiple belief systems can be true, if not all belief systems, which obviously is a very irrational concept. You know, a person cannot believe both that Isa alayhi salam is God, being a Christian, and can't say and disbelieve it at the same time being some other religion. So the belief of all these religions at the same time, just rationally, it doesn't make any sense. But the question was, what, have our ulama dealt with it? They have dealt with it extensively, not in like a short term, extensively, uh, the Asha'ira, the Maturidiyya, those people who are purely Athari, they've all dealt with it. This is not a foreign concept to us by any means. It's convenient once the artist just left. <laughs> okay, good. I can do that. <laughs>
it's lengthy. So I'll just leave it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's lengthy, so I'll just leave that. اللهم لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبوح قدوس رب الملائكة والروح سبحان الله وبحمده سبحان الله العظيم شهد الله أنه لا إله إلا هو الملائكة وولو العلم قائما بالقسط لا إله إلا هو العزيز الحكيم الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤوده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم كل ما ذكره الذاكرون وكل ما غفل عن ذكره الغافلون اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما اللهم أجلنا من النار اللهم أجلنا من النار اللهم أجلنا من النار اللهم اكفنا بحلالك حرامك وأخننا بفضلك عمن سواك يا واسع المغفرة اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزينه في قلوبنا وكره إلينا الكفرة والفسوق والعسيان وجعلنا من الراشدين اللهم توفنا مسلمين والحقنا بالصالحين غير خزايا ولا نداما ولا مفتونين يا رب العالمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا الله please accept this gathering يا رب العالمين يا الله all the efforts that have been made by the volunteers Mora Matin has come here from so far away please accept his effort as well يا رب العالمين يا الله accept all who have made any contribution to this coming together يا رب العالمين يا الله those who have come here for learning May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen their iman, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, the purpose of this gathering was your pleasure, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, give us your pleasure, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Bless us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, grant us the maghfirah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Forgive us for all the sins that we've committed, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Past, present, and future, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Rahim ar Rahmin. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, our children. Ya Allah, our children are slowly, slowly moving away from the deen of Allah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, please protect our iman and protect the iman of our children, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, please protect our aqeedah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Strengthen our aqeedah in you and your tawheed, Ya Rabbil Alameen. In the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Give us all the tawfiq to die in the state of iman, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, give us all the tawfiq to die in the state of iman, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Give us all the tawfiq to die in the same state that in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sahaba Ikram and your awliya passed away, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, give us death in the state that you are pleased with us and we are pleased with you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Give us death in the state, Ya Allah, that we are reciting the kalima, Ya Rabbil Alameen. In a state in which your pleasure is enhanced, Ya Rabbil Alameen. In which you are more pleased with us than you were before we passed away, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, give us death in the state, Ya Allah, that we see all the good that is coming from the people of, from, from Jannah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, make us amongst the people of Jannah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, you have brought us here, you have given us tawfiq to give a talk, you have given us tawfiq to listen, you have given us tawfiq to raise our hands, to make dua. Please accept all of this, Ya Rabbil Alameen, by your mercy, by your fadl, by your grace, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifoon, Wa Salamuna Ala Al Mursaleen, Wa Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam.
Jazakallah khair for uh, coming and you know we wanted to say Jazakallah for Dr. Mateen for traveling all the way from um, so many hours and you know uh, the effort and obviously the preparing the booklet and everything. Uh, one of the primary purposes of these programs was to build uh, the, the desire to learn to actually be a student again for the elderly and obviously for the students themselves to come together in an, uh, uh, in an environment and sit in front of a teacher and have this academic discourse and intensives. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to um, get, uh, give us the ability to continue these type of efforts. So um, one last thing that I would like to mention, as we can see that a lot of us are cramped and the arrangements are not such. One of the primary reasons is because we are never aware as to the number of people who are coming. So a simple registration usually helps in uh, facilitate the, uh, the accommodations as far as the literature, the, you know, the meals, the, uh, the, arrange the seating arrangements, everything overall. We can choose different venues and everything just based on the, the demand. So inshallah, uh, everyone's encouraged to register for the next time. And uh, inshallah, there will be dinner now. Um, the sisters, uh, if they can stay in the room, the brothers will go uh, down the hallway on the right hand side. There's a room, inshallah, I can show. And then we can, we'll have the, the meals being served there. So inshallah, we'll have our dinner there now. Jazakallah khair.